All right. Well, why don't we get going here? Um, I will show our uh, agenda for the day, just to remind everyone where we stand. You should see the agenda on the screen now. Um, we're on day two of our two-day meeting. Um, yesterday was a long day, but really productive, so thanks, everyone. Um, well, I'll uh, invite Nessie to give uh, any opening remarks for today if she wants to kick us off. And then we're going to go in the same order of fishery management plan as we did yesterday. And we'll start with a, a brief summary of sort of the you know, high level um, take home points um, that, uh, you know, that sort of came out during the presentations and the discussion, uh, mostly during the discussion. Um, and, uh, and then we can try to dig in deeper on those. And uh, so I will show those. And, um, um, and then if I missed anything, I think the first thing we'll do is, you know, you, I'll ask you guys to look at this brief bullet list. And, and if there are some other sort of major points um, that, um, that are not on there, then let's do that. So that'll be the process. Uh, we'll do salmon and ground fish. Uh, take a short break, um, go to coastal pelagic species and highly migratory species. And then um, as we um, as we get to, into the afternoon, we'll uh, spend some time, at least an hour, on the ecosystem fishery management plan um, and habitat. Um, we did not discuss those yesterday for reasons I explained, um, but today we will. Uh, Kit Dahl will give an overview of our ecosystem FMP, um, and uh, and I think Steve Scheiblauer is going to give us uh, an overview of habitat issues, and he's on he's on the habitat committee for the council. Um, so we'll open that up for discussion, and then um, you know we've been trying to get to public comment as we could here and there. We didn't have a whole lot of time yesterday, but we did get in some of the um, public comment, and we did. Uh, record um, all the questions that you put in the chat. And so I have all those. And so when we get to the end of the day, we'll open it up um, for public comment. And, you know, I have an hour, um, uh, you know, pegged for that. Um, we'll see how it goes. So Nessie, do you have anything to say for, um, to kick us off here? Um, not really. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's ready, um, had a good night's nice rest and ready to uh, go at it again today. I do want to close the loop. I think the last comment yesterday was all about um, like how BOEM's responsibilities and decision making process. And so I'll put on the chat the responsibilities that BOEM has um, in, in carrying out its regulations. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully that answers that question. Um, ultimately, BOEM signs the lease, so I will put those factors in that we consider, and I'll put that in the chat. And then if anyone else wants to get more information on how we do EISs, um, I would, uh, um, you know, turn them, have them look at the Vineyard Wind EIS. All those things are posted uh, on the website um, to kind of look at what's going on there. Um, you know, we're still a few years away from, from that process, but it might... Uh, provide people some insight on and how BOEM goes about um, their EIS process. So um, that is all I had. Uh, and I will put the citation to the regulations in the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Nessie. Appreciate that. Um, for the meeting principals, any other um, comments or questions before we move on to salmon? OK, then. I grabbed um, just a few sort of major points, which you should see on the screen now. I'll try to zoom in a bit here. Um, obviously, there was a lot, a lot of discussion, a lot of questions, but you know, uh, I tried to use my own notes and those that um, Bianca from Kearns and West sent over. Thank you, Bianca, um, to kind of distill down to a few of the major points and. Um, you know, thinking about the opportunities that we might have today to, um, you know, move the ball down the road a little bit um, and, um, or down the court, I guess the ball goes down the court. Um, 
and uh, you know dig in a little more and identify uh, maybe answer some of these questions if they are if they haven't been answered yet and um, try to identify um, you know sort of next steps forward or data gaps or things like that so um, you know my take home points for salmon were um, that you know, we spend a fair bit of time on the electromagnetic field impacts. Um, there was a study that showed um, transmission line in um, San Francisco Bay uh, that was not a hindrance to salmon migration, but there was also discussion about, you know, whether that was apples to apples. And, you know, we don't really know what the nature of these um, transmission cables would be. You know, what does that e electromagnetic field look like? Um, it might not be the same that was in that uh, study. Um, we talked about cable routes quite a bit, especially in the Morro Bay call area. Um, and so that might warrant uh, further discussion. Um, then there was this concern that we've heard in other FMPs and at other times that, um, you know, that the impacts aren't analyzed um, enough during this planning the phase that BOEM is in right now, which you know includes the call areas and the wind energy areas, you know, before they uh, go into the application um, phase. Um, so uh, the concern is, you know, that there's not enough analysis of impacts in, until that final phase, when uh, you know an applicant is actually putting together their plan um, and developing an EIS, or BOEM is developing an EIS, and the concern is that, well, it's too late. So, you know, I think that our BOEM colleagues uh, did a pretty good job of addressing that, but um, I wanted to include that because, you know, we discussed it, and, and I've heard that a couple other times as well. Um, um, in the same vein, we also talked about this, you know, 6% of California waters um, in, um, you know, as potentially suitable for offshore wind right now. And, you know, what is that, um, you know, what's the numerator and denominator? And is it comparable to Oregon and Washington? We talked about uh, the depth uh, of the continental shelf. It's very different north of the Mendocino Ridge uh, and south. Um, and so there was this um, desire to dig into those uh, numbers a little bit more. And someone, I think it was maybe Karin who su suggested uh, trying to get some sort of apples to apples comparison. Um, and then there was uh, some discussion about the cumulative effects of fishing closures. And um, so that was, um, those were the sort of the major take home bullet points that I identified. So let me turn to um, the, our meeting principles and, and, you know, perhaps others who were, you know, heavily engaged. I don't think Robin is on today, um, our salmon staff officer, no, but, um, is there anything missing here as sort of a major take home point or, um, you know, something that we could, um, uh, discuss in more in depth today? Okay. Well, then, why don't we uh, open it up to these um, five bullet points? Let's start with uh, electromagnetic field impacts, and um, and I also, you know, want to remind everyone to think about this in terms of um, you know the uh, sort of prompt questions that we talked about yesterday. I can't remember if I put them on the screen or not, but you know the questions are you know where are the data gaps? Um, where can we get the data that is missing? Oh, that was yeah, that was kind of the biggest overarching comment that I didn't include, but I'm going to add it now. Is that there's not a whole lot of data that um, Bohm has right now um, for salmon. It's a little bit data poor. They have VMS information, they have some other information, but there's not a lot out there right now. So that's one of the you know key issues here and one of the prompt questions. Um, and then, um, you know, I invite everyone to think about, you know, wh what, would a, what would a scenario look like uh, in terms of, let's say, call areas or individual wind farms, you know, what would be sort of a least impact scenario? Um, and that might include, you know, 
things like, can you fish in between the windmills or not? And um, is there avoidance and things like that? Um, yeah, so with that, I'm gonna step back and uh, open it up and um, open up for discussion here. Please use your raise hand feature. Principals can just jump in because you aren't, if you're a co-host, you don't get to raise your hand. So you just have to jump in. Thanks, thanks, Gary. I'll, I'll just start with that first bullet that's there. I remember we didn't get to that point in the discussion. I think Mike I might have asked a question in the chat about the ratings, uh, EMF ratings on the cables in the studies and whether they're comparable. So um, if I recall, you know, it was a question about the, the voltage rating of the lines and, and how that would relate to the ones we would expect at the project and aren't the projects much bigger than those lines would be. So it, it was a comparison between volts and watts, which is not a direct correlation. You, you can't really compare them that way. High voltage transmission lines tend to be in the 230 kV kilovolt range, uh, 500 kilovolts are the really big ones you see along the highway. Um, that's not a, that's not a, um, a, how do I say it? It's, it's not exactly equivalent to the number of megawatts that might be carried. For example, a 500 kilovolt rated transmission line might have thousands of megawatts on it. Um, but just as that for that background, then I'll say for the study purposes, um, you also cannot perfectly relate EMF signatures to the rating of the cable. When, you know whether it's a one, uh, 150 or 220 or 230 or a 500 kilovolt line. It's more important to know what is the construction, the kind of the the environment that the transmission cable is in, and what it's made of, the materials, and and a lot of other factors. Um, and I don't mean to make this too complicated. I'm, I'm just trying to say that uh, I, I would expect knowing that when we finally get a COP, we'll see that um, the transmission lines used underwater for the wind projects will probably be fairly similar to those ones studied uh, in some of the studies that Donna pointed out. So I, I think we'll be able to um, draw some comparisons there. Uh, EMF is a super interesting field of study as you guys are well aware. And, as Donna showed, one of the things they measured was the bridge. Uh, you know, it's not just transmission cables that have EMF, you know, that's electricity and magnetic uh, fields. Uh, other structures like that bridge had a very large EMF um, signature. So uh, again, I guess the short answer to kind of the point of discussion that was raised there was, I, I do think that we have some information that we will be able to draw on in those studies that will inform uh, what we think about the MF uh, on the cables related to both the injury array and the export to shore transmission cables on the wind farms. Hey, this is Darius Peak, the SAS. Yeah, hey, Darius. Um, let's go to Donna first, um, okay. and we'll go to you next, and raise your hand if you get a chance. I don't have a hand thing. Oh, you don't have a hand thing. Okay, well, we'll make you, you'll go next after Donna. Thank you. Uh, that was great, Rick. Thanks. Um, I would like to point out that one of the studies that um, was presented yesterday that uh, Bum funded the Normando et al. document is one of the first ones that I showed. That is a really a great resource that measured um, all the EMF signatures from different cables um, known at that time. And basically, the electromagnetic field is dependent upon the load that it's carried by the cable. And something called the Bonneville power equation um, is used to calculate what that um, EMF signature would be. And remember, um, these fields interact with existing fields. So you know, maybe a better way to describe it is the distortion in the field. For the most part, electric fields are contained within the cable and the magnetic signature, which is measured in Tesla, is what is experienced in the environment. So we've done some field testing of the Bonneville power equation and we find that it predicts it um, pretty well. So a lot of information, a huge amount of information is included in that report if people wanna um, look further into that. And the range of cables that we looked at is uh, consistent with the range of cables we would expect within an uh, offshore wind farm. 
Okay, thank you, Donna. Any um, follow up or clarification for Donna? Okay, then let's um, go to Darius Peak. Go ahead, Darius. Thanks, Kerry. Um, the um, I appreciate the electromagnetic field impacts. Um, one thing to notice that mag uh, excuse me, salmon are magnetically driven, and being that it doesn't take much to alter their patterns and to change their migratory patterns. And for an example, I was up at the hatchery on the, there's this research hatchery up on the Alcida River. And we actually went out to a tank of, of salmon and placed a small magnet on the side of it. And the salmon, instead of swimming into a circle like this, changed their pattern. They just kind of went haywire until they could figure out what to do. And then they still were not in their migratory pattern or excuse me, the pattern around the tank. So it might be just an idea for Boehm to get involved with the hatchery, it's an ODF and W hatchery on the Alsay River and might bring them into the picture. Thanks. Yeah, this is Donna, uh, thanks for that. Um, I'd like to mention a specific study that has was done by some of our Canadian colleagues about uh, the homing ability of salmon in the wild. And I think it was called the Fraser River. It's a really interesting system uh, when salmon return home to their natal, uh, natal stream, they encounter Vancouver Island. And uh, as probably many of you know, there's slight ge um, geomagnetic variation in the Earth's field, and it varies year to year. Um, and depending on what that signal is, the salmon will either go north of the island to get to their home stream or south of the island. So if anyone has ever studied a fish behavior, you know they're multi-sensory creatures and the magnetic field is something that they use along with smell and sound and everything else. So um, their uh, body of work shows that um, they use many other senses to find their home. So um, you know, a global variation in the magnetic field did not in any way uh, prevent them from re reaching their destination because of this, what they theorize, their multi-sensory cues. And so when, uh, and that's a pretty substantial alteration. Any kind of magnetic field distortion from a cable is what we've measured generally around the order of one meter from the cable core. So it's not very big. It's not a global wide magnetic field. And there's a lot of other EMF studies I could discuss. And if the council is interested in, you know, it might be better uh, for a specific presentation. So, you know, EMF is a sort of an interesting uh, topic because humans aren't really familiar with that very much. And there's a lot of misunderstanding of how things work. So I'd be happy to do that. Um, I will mention in some of the other summaries, um, some of which I mentioned yesterday, particularly those from the Department of Energy lab, they view that EMF is a non-issue and they've had several published papers when they have described something called risk retirement and they feel that EMF concerns should be put in that category. Um, the uh, Bohm's perspective, I should say, is you know not that strong and we're certainly willing to entertain um, more ideas about EMF and the potential um, impact that have so, but I just want to say that all evidence so far suggests that this is not going to be a, a significant uh, impact. We'd probably put in the uh, neg negligible or very local minor level of impact. And this is a good example of what I was mentioning yesterday between effects and impacts. So a good way to think of EMF is sort of like noise and you have like a group of people and someone drops a plate, you know, it's going to have an effect on the crowd that some people are going to look and some people are going to ignore it. So that noise has an effect on people's hearing. They can detect it, but do they change their behavior? Do they leave the room? Do they stop eating or whatever? That's kind of a useful analogy to think how EMF affects fishes. They, no doubt, some of the magnetic sensitive fishes can detect variations in the magnetic field because of their sensory um, structures. But whether it prevents a behavior that's critical to their life history, like does it prevent them from reaching their natal stream, which is why they use a magnetic sense, 
there isn't any, any evidence out there that suggests that happens. If you have any evidence, that'd be great. But a lot of information has been um, collected so far, a lot of studies, and I can review those if necessary. So that's kind of the summary of the state of the science on that aspect. Thank, thanks, Donna. I'm just gonna um, add, this is Rick Yard again, sorry, uh, Office of Envi Environment with Bowen. Um, so I see questions popping up on EMF in the chat as well. And I, I know, I understand it's, it's always been a rich area of um, conversation in transmission projects. Uh, I, I do think that uh, we have some, some information about it. There will be analysis in the uh, NEPA documents that come up for the projects. So uh, I'm going to suggest, and I hope this is not gonna upset anyone. I'm gonna suggest that we don't spend all of our time on salmon talking about EMF because there are other topics of conversation here um, and say, why don't we continue on with topics and Carrie, what do you think about focusing on bullets that have to do with data for now, in case we run out of time, so we get to the most urgent questions first? Well, I think that's reasonable. I was just um, looking at the clock. We have, um, you know, we have another twenty-seven minutes here to finish up. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the point has been made about EMF and. Um, um, Donna, could you provide links to any of the, I think you said it was national academies or, um, you know, studies that, um, that get at this issue. And then maybe we can, I see one more hand up. We'll do, uh, we'll go to Karen Braby and then, um, um, you know, but if Donna, if you could maybe provide some links, that would be helpful. And then we can probably move on. So that's not a bad suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Karen Braby, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and council member. Um, I uh, just wanted to weigh in on Rick's point that, um, you know, today's uh, discussion is going to be far ranging, but the primary, the primary focus is on data, um, but to address the questions about uh, things like EMF impacts, um, I think it would be helpful to reiterate what uh, what BOEM might require to be put in place in terms of monitoring for a project. And so in, in a case like EMF, where there are a lot of questions and a lot of concerns and not enough data to address every particular species and situation, how are, uh, how are the projects going to be uh, put in place and what are the expectations around monitoring for those projects to look for issues of concern. Um, you're hearing loud and clear that EMF and salmon is a big concern. So how is that going to be, you know, we're not going to get the data to satisfy all the questions between now and when a potential project might go in. So how does a monitoring program actually help uh, address that and and how would uh, that potentially lead to adaptive management. So I'm hoping that maybe uh, Bohm can talk about that just a little bit so that we have that in mind as we're talking about data and focusing on that. Sure, you know, when we get to the um, project evaluation stage uh, and do our analysis on this and, you know, all the other matters that are um, of interest, relevant and of interest to everyone, um, we will draw out those issues that have the most potential to be impactful on resources and um, look for ways to, as Donna described yesterday, avoid and minimize any kind of impacts. And, uh, and as conditions of approval, I think, is the way these are normally handled, we, we may consider identifying things where there's still lingering questions about potential impacts and the need to monitor and, and, and uh, uh, perhaps institute an adaptive management program as you anticipated, Karin. Um, I'll say that I, right now, based on past uh, analyses that I'm aware of, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect EMF to be one of those. Uh, who knows? We'll see when we get there. I, I, I don't know that Vineyard Wind ended up uh, with big questions on EMF. Um, 
But like I said, we're, we're quite a ways out from uh, getting to an actual proposal to see what the, the project specific uh, potential impacts are and, and where we go from there. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve Scheiblauer, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, you can hear me now? Yep. Uh, yeah, my, my question is related to uh, this discussion that, you know, would not a place also for these concerns about EMF uh, be in the construction and operations plan? In other words, you know, could BOEM, you know, require uh, very uh, robust, if you will, protections against it uh, of, of the developer? Uh, this is Donna, just real quickly. Um, generally, the main mitigation action uh, for cables that are on the bottom is to bury them um, at least one meter in the substrate. We don't know if that's going to be something that's going to be required out here. Again, a lot of these questions would be addressed at the construction and operations phase. Um, uh, so it's really hard, you know, we haven't, we don't have a project, we don't even have a lease yet. So a lot of these, I know that these are really important questions for everyone, but they're almost impossible to answer unless we have um, more idea, a better idea of what kind of project might go out there. So um, in, in discussions of the impacts go in a very specific place in a NEPA document. And so they probably would not be in the discussions of what we call project description. And I guess the quick answer, Steve, is yes. Um, you know, during the, the COP stage, um, if there are issues that result in, um, you know, potential impacts, then we will address it then. Um, you know, and I think what we're saying right now is, you know, we're not there and we don't know yet, but I mean, we'll continue um, to uh, have that issue with us. And uh, throughout the process, there'll be scoping and comments. So. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys won't let us forget that. And so we will, you know, it's gonna be a, uh, a topic that will continue to be with us. And if, if at the end of the day, um, it's appropriate to put, um, you know, additional mitigation measures, then that could happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Arlene Merrams. Hi, um, thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, so I recall a while back, it's been a few years, but I recall reading a study and I think it was out of Scotland where they had salmon in net pens and they were testing EMF fields um, and salmon response in situ. And so it, it allowed them, you know, to take this experiment out of the lab and into a real situation where salinity and current and other factors would um, more, you know, thoroughly examine that question. And they, I recall that there was a response to, um, you know, in the fish and how they were behaving around certain levels of magnetic field. So in terms of that, you know, data question, and additional studies to examine that question in situ in areas where um, you know there's potential for setting up wave energy um, structures. If, if that's something that could be still considered, because it seems like it, it could be um, you know specific to certain areas or or certain stages life stages you know juvenile out migrating salmon um so i just wanted to ask if that is still potential right on this the table uh this is well everything's on the table because we don't have a construction operations plan yet so um you know these discussions can be revisited at that time uh, but about that Scotland study, I am not familiar with any study that looked at uh, sensitivity of salmon Scotland uh, using pens. I am familiar with a different study that looked at electromagnetic species like, say, rays, um, some skates that live on the bottom and smaller sharks. And what they found was no significant difference when there was a cable energized or unenergized. What they did detect was that some individuals a certain ray or skate 
changed their swimming speed when the cable was on, but there was not a population why a detectable um, response, right? So it was individual based and they swam faster um, when the AC cable was on. So um, that is again, a good um, illustration of an effect. Some individuals swam faster over the cable when it was on, uh, but no population impact. So, um, but if there's another study that I'm a, unaware of, of salmon, uh, I would appreciate you forward that to me. Um, uh, but I think, you know, that the approach that we've taken here on the West Coast is when you have a stimulus for behavior, you know, behavior experiments are, are, can be somewhat complicated for their experimental design. And that's why, you know, using the 400 megawatt cable um, was going to give the strongest uh, signal because as I said, stated before, the load uh, through a cable gives the strong, strongest signal. And we were like super fortunate that there was this telemetry data on salmon before and after the cable was energized. And even with this gigantic signature of the cable and with the gigantic signature of the bridge across the bay, which is an order of magnitude higher than the cable signature, there was no uh, detection on uh, on salmon. So there, you know, there is pretty good evidence that there might be an effect, but no impact. And so when we get a particular project, we can look at what the cables um, are proposed during a project and then have discussions and develop uh, a monitoring and um, you know, any kind of mitigation plan at that time. But as far as further investigations, you know, millions and millions of dollars have been spent already trying to find an effect um, even, and, and it has not been, um, there hasn't been much detected at all. So it's a low priority for us right now. But if there is some other evidence that changes that, we'll consider that uh, option again. But I just don't, don't wanna give a misleading um, signal here that, that this is a higher priority. It was identified as a priority back at the Oregon Renewable Energy Conference. So we put a lot of effort and time studying this and all the studies so far have come back with uh, nothing significant. So that is the state of the science at this point. Um, if you'd like to bring other evidence to the table or other kinds of data sources, we'd be certainly happy to look at that. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Yvonne, your, your turn. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to follow up. There were two comments that caught my ear. One was um, Steve Scheiblauer had some suggestions for a monitoring program as part of the permitting process. And uh, then Nessie, I think you said that NIMFS would keep track of that. And uh, we don't, for this meeting, we had not set up any sort of thing, list of things for NIMFS to keep track of. So if Steve, would you mind putting your comment in the chat? Because I thought it was really useful. Um, and I would just say to the folks in BOEM that the um, people on West Coast Fisheries Management have a lot of um, history with projects that only impact salmon a little and there are probably thousands of those projects that only impact salmon a little. And um, cumulatively, that's been a challenge for us. So uh, I guess maybe think about the cumulative effects of human activities on salmon rather than just the particular impacts of this, of particular projects. Thank you. Um, this is Nessie and uh, Yvonne, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I'm the one that that um, talked about NIMS. So, I, I mean, I, that would, you know, someone else can, can clarify what we're expecting from you. Um, but I think just what I heard today is that if we translate it into potential action items is that we'll provide links of 
studies that we're aware of. Uh, we would look to PFMC and, and others um, to provide information to us that would um, be helpful as well. We'll look into the ODFW hatchery. So if someone can put the contact in the chat, that would be useful. And then I think what we said is that we're not dismissing EMF at this point. And um, as we go forward with the uh, analysis and when we have a project, um, clearly, you know, we're, th that would be still be one of the issues that we will address in those documents. Okay, thank you. I wasn't suggesting that you were dismissing it. I just didn't want to lose uh, the the monitoring, including monitoring as part of these projects comment. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think those will, you know, if, if it ends up being that way when we have projects, I mean, I, I mean, clearly, I think for, for not only this, but for anything else that um, we're, we're monitoring is appropriate, um, I think we will have that. Okay, thank you, Nessie and Yvonne. Um, anyone else? What, let's talk about the uh, overall lack of salmon data. That was the first thing that Bohm said yesterday. Um, you know, what are the data sources that um, that you know that we need to provide? You know, from the council side um, that aren't there. Um, you know, how can we help Bohm uh, flesh out their um, you know data repository? Um, uh, with regard to salmon. Uh, well, this is Donna. If there are logbook data that shows the distribution of effort for salmon trollers, that would be useful. This is Darius. I'll look on the uh, distribution and also uh, a few more comments from the SAS about placement, uh, the size of the farm, the buffer zones, um, and noise. And so, and if that all gets something typed up or done to you and send it off to Boehm, if that's all right with you guys. And Tom uh, Haper, Haper was looking for more information. Um, Great Britain probably has more of these things on the water than uh, anybody I've found so far. And they have a lot of information, some pro, some con but it's uh, very interesting to read. Thank you. That sounds perfect. Thank you, Darius. Yeah, thank you, Darius. And Donnie, Donna. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I was uh, asking our uh, PFMC family for that, but um, Donna, you jumped in and um, made a data request. So, you know, that definitely extend that to um, Boehm also um, to, you know, let us know what you need. All right, well, um, I don't re I'm almost afraid to go back to this point. It's this uh, point that's been made several times that you know, fisheries uh, impacts aren't analyzed sufficiently until the application stage and then it's too late. So, um, you know, I uh, don't wanna rehash when not necessary, but uh, I think it might be worth um, maybe a quick rehash at least, um, just to sort of, you know, let Bohm, it, it, answer that. I know you did yesterday, but um, I think it wouldn't hurt to sort of summarize that and, um, you know, let people ask questions if they have any. Uh, you know, I'll um, sort of give a quick summary again of what I think Bohm's process looks like and um, understanding that we hear concerns a lot about our phased approach and that um, there's a you know, sometimes a, perhaps a feeling that uh, by the time we get to the most rigorous study of some impacts to resources, uh, it's too late. Uh, it, my, my response to that would be, um, you know, you know the, the phased approach is almost a misnomer because we have uh, a continuous and ongoing sort of approach that starts uh, very early 
when we're thinking about call areas. And before we even get to call areas, we've already been doing some winnowing as Nessie described about, you know, working with the state and other stakeholders and, and um, targeting call areas in California, for example, pretty far offshore to avoid some known potential interactions and resource impacts. We get to calls um, and get more input. We do lease uh, sale analyses and get more input about a lease sale and at that. Those early stages, it's really about whether it's worth considering a site further. You know, um, it, it's, it's about what's even on the table. And once we get past the lease sale stage, we continue to study for several years to see what are the potential impacts of this, what can be avoided and what can be minimized. Uh, will it even go forward at all? There is precedent for proposals to not go forward. It's not uh, perhaps gonna be the most common route, but it is certainly possible. Um, so uh, understanding, again, we hear this comment. I, I do hear what you're saying. I do understand the concern. I, I would push back and say it is not inevitable and it's not too late. It's not that we look at fisheries for the first time when we get to the COP. That's the stage at which we're looking to see what are actual impacts from a project and how do we avoid and minimize. But we've been thinking about the range of resources and other users uh, continuously since we started this process, this planning process with California and have uh, already you know, begun that winnowing process. Um, it, well, I, I'll see if others in BOEM want to make a, build on that and make a better answer than I tried to. I guess your answer was perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Rick. Um, okay, what about uh, cable routes off the Morro Bay call area? Anyone want to dig into that a little bit? All right, well, maybe we've, oh, Steve Scheiblauer, go ahead. Steve. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it is it is definitely something that needs to be considered in a holistic manner as, as we're trying to move forward and gather information. But I also want to point out that there has been an industry and I think uh, even FERC discussion about a, uh, a potential uh, cable route from Oregon to the Bay Area undersea cable route. Uh, and so, you know, that is a very different animal. <laughs> and I don't think that's in Bohm's wheelhouse, um, but uh, that's another thing that's sort of laying out there uh, that would be a pretty big impact and uh, needs to be somehow put into the discussion at some place. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Steve, would you mind, I know that um, our note taker is capturing these, but if you wouldn't mind uh, putting that into the chat, then we'll have it uh, double captured, please. Sure. Doesn't have to be the second, but at some point. Okay, anything else on salmon? We got five minutes left. Okay, well then let's move on. Let's move on to ground fish. Um, that's next up. Um, let me, oops, I didn't need to stop share. I think I can just keep. No. Shoot. Bear with me. I think I hey, Carrie, this is this is Frank. Yeah. And I'm just realizing that a specific thing where you know, we're asking uh, data questions and something that could be very useful for us would be if, uh, for you know, salmon is if anyone has any comments on speeds. So what what we are calling 
fishing speeds. So uh, the speeds at which people are trawling, like is there a minimum where you would consider it fishing? Is there a maximum where you would consider it fishing? Obviously these numbers are never perfect, but just if we can get input from the salmon fishers on that, it could be something very useful and practical that we could put right to use. Okay. Anyone want to follow up on that or is that just a comment for the record? Okay, then here we are. I accidentally closed this. All I had to do was scroll down. Um, so you should see on the screen uh, some of the main points from groundfish from day one. <coughs> um, there was a suggestion that data and studies should go back to the 1990s or even earlier or more accurate picture of the fisheries history. Um, there, starting in the late 90s, there was a uh, you know, massive change in the, um, in the magnitude and the location um, of the groundfish fishery. A lot of um, species were declared overfished and there was special uh, rationalization and um, started the cut share program. And anyway, for a lot of reasons, um, it looked very different in the you know, 90s and 80s and 70s than it did and uh, you know, after that. Um, so um, there was one point. Um, and then the question of uh, how would a dynamic fishery like the whiting fishery be considered uh, in offshore wind sighting? Um, obviously that one moves around more and is not as sort of site dependent as um, you know, some of the, uh, like the bottom tending gear or bottom trawl fishery. Um, and uh, how many ports might uh, change with offshore wind development? That was another question. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the uh, vessel transit and how that might be affected by the presence of offshore uh, wind farms. Uh, Bohm said yesterday that they're looking at uh, transit data. Um, so I guess the question would be, you know, uh, does Bohm have um, the, uh, you know, an adequate library of um, transit information to use. So you might want to talk about that a little more. Um, <clears throat> there's a need to update the spatial and temporal mapping information for trawl areas um, that were previously closed to trawling. And um, you know, I think that I put bottom trawling or bottom in uh, parentheses because the, the notes just said trawling, but um, as I recall, that's, uh, well, you know, it's the bottom trawling that has been uh, you know, primarily affected by our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our fishery management actions. Sorry, got a frog in my throat. Um, uh, there could be informal bycatch areas that uh, the fishing fleet avoids, which make them de facto closed areas. And then um, there's a suggestion to go directly to the fishing organizations for a deeper dive. So, um, you know, I hope that there's enough people that have been uh, on this meeting yesterday and today that can either represent those fishing organizations or, um, you know, or provide links or contacts, um, you know, or some sort of intermediary to those fishing organizations. Uh, that is the idea of um, what we're doing here. Uh, yesterday and today, or part of it. So those were the main points. Um, what is missing here from sort of the main take home points? Well, uh, this is Donna. I'd like to say that I, I mentioned in my presentation several times that one of the things that the council could be very helpful with, if they could provide data or an approach at least on how we could document the use of call areas by non-local fishers. By non-local fishers, so um, like coming from out of state or a different part of the state, is that what you mean? Right, even interstate, so, um, so you know, 
it would be good to understand, um, you know, most of the use is assumed to be um, from local fishers, but, you know, how do we document um, use by the area from people far away? Because sometimes we get that those comments. Oh, I see. So you're talking about like, you know, literally going to a port, um, uh, you know, meeting room, either real or virtual, and, you know, meeting with those people, but you wouldn't capture the, you know, person who is home ported uh, somewhere else and only, you know, uh, you know, just isn't home ported there, but they still fish off those waters. Right. And especially the people that do not have VMS data. Right, right. Okay. Good point. Steve Scheiblauer. Steve. Just to thank Donna for that point. And I, I am aware that there are swordfish people from San Diego and elsewhere south of the bite that do come up and fish there and then return. So yeah, thank you for that. And uh, you know, I think there's some people that can help you with that. This is Nessie and just kind of following up on that, Steve, who, who should we be talking to or who can provide that data? Probably the best central person in the San Diego area would be uh, Pete Helme. He's connected with others. I mean, Arthur Lorton, people like that are, are the sort of fish people that actually come up. Um, and maybe offline, I could give you more, more contact info. That would be helpful. Thank you. I thought Pete was an urchin diver. Yes, but he's sort of the leader, leader of the bunch down there. Good. Okay, anything else missing from the uh, main take home points? All right, so then let's um, dig into this a little bit. So um, data and studies should go back to the 1990s or earlier. So, you know, I remember, um, and so will Kaylee Summers and several others who were involved in the um, ground fish EFH review process, which and also combined the reopening of the um, bottom or the trawl RCA. Um, uh, that we, like I mentioned, we ran into a lot of um, you know similar um, issues where um, you know it's really hard to compare um, you know what it used to be then and what it is now, and we were trying to look at uh, impacts and um, you know because fishing behavior is very different now. And it was very different in 2006, and it was very different in you know 1990. Um, so first of all, it's a little bit hard to look at effects and impacts, and you know just even something as basic as spatial extent. You know where where are they fishing, and where are they not? Where do they avoid? Um, so uh, you know we do we have logbook data. Um, uh, some of it is better quality than others. Um, I'm going back a few years when we were doing this uh, Amendment 28 uh, EFH review business. Um, but you know, maybe I'll open it up. I guess I'll look to um, um, Bohm to maybe comment on what you think are some of the data gaps and um, then also to our PFMC advisory body members, you know, to um, uh, you know, to either respond or to point them or discuss uh, what sort of data, you know, may be available that isn't being considered right now. Um, Michael Kineski, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I apologize, but I, my internet got cut off there for a while. Uh, looking at these main points on ground fish, it's the third bullet point down discussed how many ports may change with OS W development. I think we specifically should include processors and other infrastructure um, support and infrastructure. And that would be, well, for Whiting in particular, that one would be pretty critical if they were forced to really curtail how they buy Whiting or, or any fish for that matter just out of uh, economic necessity. So if, you, if that were expanded a little bit, I'd feel better about it anyway. Because it just sounds like how many ports may change, that's pretty broad and it doesn't really get down to the meat of it.
Okay. Uh, Steve Schadbauer. Yes, thank you. Uh, I made this point a little bit yesterday on the same topic about uh, going back, but my concern is that that you need to go back to understand what the future could be. And, and the groundfish uh, bottom trawl fishery is, is just a great example of that in the Morro Bay area where it was such a robust fishery. And, and now all this, you know, the elements are really there in terms of the richness of the resources for, for it to be an, a, a really important fishery in that area. And it's more a matter of sort of some economic issues that have, that have stopped that so far. But, but again, the potential is there. And so if there's a question in this, it's how will you all be able to, or yeah, consider, you know, the, the future and whether or not actions, you know, really take away a future for a fishery or, or not. And in the case of groundfish, again, the elements are there that it could realistically be, you know, an important fishery in the future. Thank you. Hey, Steve, um, Mike Conroy. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have, and one thing that may be helpful for Bo moving forward on this, and I don't know if this is part of the plan when reviewing, analyzing, gathering data on ground, which is it gonna be sort of sector specific? Um, it, it, I, I, and I don't know the answer to this, but my guess would be that, you know, an area like the Humboldt Call area may be an inconvenience to everybody, um, but for a trawl vessel or others who, who have more range, you know, they're, they're more, they have more ability and are less dependent on that area than say a small boat uh, fisherman out of Humboldt or Crescent City who might not have, you know, the, the, the ability to make a 30 or 40 or 50 mile move. Um, so that's, it, it, I just throwing that out as something that maybe need to be considered as well moving forward on this, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Michael Kaneski. Yeah, I'd say Mike has got a good point, but I, I think you have to actually specify fleets when you're doing this as far as the analysis goes. Uh, Mike's point is that you could totally ruin or take away an opportunity for smaller boats unless they move locations or ports. Uh, but 50, 50 miles extra in driving time and whatnot on a larger trawl vessel is still a lot of money and, you know, markets being what they are, uh, we're attempting to reduce costs, not increase them. So it, there's still that factor in there, in, not just about losing the opportunity, but also how you increase the cost. Now that, that's one point I wanted to make. And second, in here, I mean, I think fishery by fishery, you have to look at how many areas, how much actual real estate is left right now before any uh, offshore wind energy construction plans go into place. You know, how much of the ocean is closed off presently? And so you get a better, uh, the actual amount of fishing room that they have or real estate they have now, because it's not the whole ocean by any means. So, uh, and I think Karin addressed that yesterday, but I, I believe it should be incorporated probably into each one of these as, as something to study because you're, you, you, it, just like California, for example, it might be 6% of all the water off California, but it may only, it may be like 20% of, or 30% of available water that's left for fishing as of right now. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Lynn Mattis, followed by Heather Mann. Thanks, Carrie. And, and I apologize, I had to miss the, the groundfish discussion yesterday, but um, looking at your bullet point about the um, spatial and temporal mapping for trawl areas. Uh, I think we need to include that for non-trawl areas as well because the council is currently looking at opening up some non-trawl RCA areas um, for fixed gear, um, for different fixed gear fleets. 
Uh, so the, the non-trawl fisheries will be important to look at as well. Thank you, Lynn, who we noted. Um, we are doing pretty well time-wise. Uh, go ahead, Heather. Um, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, everyone. Uh, like Lynn, I was uh, unable to participate yesterday, but I <clears throat> had two comments. Um, the first is around, I think, a comment that was made yesterday that there was virtually no whiting fishery um, or fishing occurring off California, and um, that's not accurate. Uh, so we looked at the data and about 23% of the mothership catch of vessels um, and about 5% of shoreside was actually taken uh, recently below um, 42 degrees. It's just not delivered into um, the state of California. And so um, that's, there. there is whiting fishing occurring um, and it kind of ties into the discussion that's been going on about um, home ported boats. You know, that really is not, um, a good indicator when you look at fisheries like whiting, which are just really highly mobile. And, um, you know, so for example, I'm in Newport and the boats I work with are mostly home ported in Newport, but during the whiting season, they're following the whiting um, to where they can find clean fishing. And that's anywhere from, you know, 20 miles south of the California border all the way up to, um, you know, the Northern Washington waters. And so um, it really doesn't matter where they're home ported um, to figure out where they're fishing for some of these, these stocks that are highly mobile. And when you combine that with all the restrictions that whiting fishermen have to go by, you know, avoiding certain species, trying to avoid Chinook, um, then uh, all those things combined also feed into where they can find the whiting. And so for more information on whiting, um, Boehm should feel free to contact you know, me yeah. at uh, Midwater um, Trawlers Cooperative, uh, Brent Payne at United Catcher Boats, and um, Dan Waldeck at the Pacific Whiting Conservation Council. But I think there's, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, details with whiting that are sort of different, I think, than some of the other fisheries where people are going out on one and two day trips and delivering ground fish back into their, their home ports. Thanks. Hi, this is Nessie. You, you, you sound like uh, you have a lot of data that we need and you rattled up a whole bunch of contacts. Bianca's a good note taker, but she may not have captured it all. So can you put that information in the chat, please, the, the contacts? Sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mike Okineski, is your hand back up or is it still up from before? No, I do have a uh, subsequent uh, the comment that Heather made. We have a shoreside whiting co-op that has a lot of, well, information. I don't know how much they can share, but I'll put that number down to you. Um, amongst those other ones, those are great recommendations that Heather made. Uh, and the other one is, I, I just want to emphasize that these boats are highly mobile because of the restrictions, but because if they aren't, it just totally tears apart their business plan. And so the areas that they fish in one day may not be the areas they can fish in the next day due to bycatch or just movement of a target species, Hague itself. So. That's a very important component of uh, their ability to make the, you know, fishery work for them as far as uh, economics go. It's it's not just because they can catch whiting anywhere in the ocean. I want to stress that point. Thank you, Mike. Uh, anything else on? that particular topic. All right, so we did touch on um, the dynamic, you know, nature of the fishery. They move around a lot. So I don't think we need to, um, you know, discuss that anymore. Um, 
I, I didn't quite follow the, someone did mention this, um, you know, how many ports would may change with offshore wind development. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch what was said today. So can whoever was speaking to that a little bit ago, could you please speak up again? Someone said something. Lynn Mattis. I think I think Mike. Okay, I, was, I, I was gonna say in, in my notes, I think it was Mike O um, talking about uh, needing to include the processors and port infrastructure um, when looking at how ports change. That's what I captured in my notes. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay. Um, Moving on, um, uh, we talked about, um, well, we might have covered everything here. We talked about updating the spatial and temporal mapping and um, Lynn made the comment that it should be non-trawl also in addition to the trawl, trawling. Um, the Civic Council is, you know, has been discussing um, uh, reopening a non-trawl um, rockfish conservation area um, for some time. So, you know, there are um, there are changes that are on the horizon and you don't want to miss, um, you know, you don't want to miss those. So, um, Nessie and, um, you know, Rick and Boehm, we can, uh, I'm happy to point you towards the right direction. You also have uh, people on this call that, um, you know, are engaged in that, but basically any of our uh, staff officer or any of our ground fish staff officers, you know, or me could, um, um, you know, point you in the right direction if, if there's you know, more information uh, that you need. Lynn. Yeah, um, I, again, I apologize if this was covered yesterday. Um, too many things going on this week. Uh, it's something I've noticed in, all of these meetings I've attended over the last few months is the lack of information on recreational fisheries. While most of the recreational bottom fish fishery, ground fish fisheries do occur near or shore, it does also occur offshore and could be affected by some of these, these areas and the, the transmission lines. Um, it's true that recreational fisheries don't have BMS, they don't have AIS, et cetera, but uh, there is some, there could be some information available, um, maybe not the super fine scale, like a GPS coordinate, but I, I know in Oregon, our state, our dockside sampling program collects information on reef location where folks were fishing. Um, so, you know, it's some fairly large spatial data, but there is spatial data. Um, and I, I just don't want the recreational fisheries to be discounted in this because it is a large component of fishing activity um, on the coasts and it, it can be a huge economic contributor to certain coastal ports. Thank you, Lynn, excellent point. Okay, anyone else on ground fish? We've got 40 more minutes to kill, so we can either uh, fill it or we can get ahead of schedule. Okay. okay. Hey, Carrie. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't find my hand raising function. <laughs> I know it's there. I used it a minute ago. I just wanted to, if, if it's helpful, I had additional notes that um, Mike had. Uh, from Mike's comments about the plants and the ports. Um, I don't know if he's on the phone, but uh, what I had written down was that he um, identified the fact that the shoreside infrastructure, you know, is pretty well established, but if you, if it becomes severely impacted, um, it would be hard to get that back up and running, you know, once it's gone. Um, and so he was mentioning the need for identifying those infrastructure assets and the need for mitigation um, 
I'm just making that part of the overall analysis. And the need to, to reach out to fishing organizations directly for you know, their ideas on specific issues and information around that whole infrastructure situation. Okay, thanks, Arlene. Um, you were fading out there a little bit, um, a little bit faint, but- uh, Oh, sorry about heard, that. No problem, though. I think uh, I, I heard you well enough to get your point. Um, okay, here's some more hands up. Uh, Steve Scheiblauer, followed by Louis Zim. Yes, thank you. I wanted to just make a comment about changes to uh, harbors and ports. And, um, you know, if you have an example of like the relatively small Morro Bay Harbor that uh, in that community of Morro Bay has really been centered around uh, being a fishing community and its tourism industry is really centered around the working waterfront and fishing. And then it changes to be, uh, you know, maybe dominated, if you will, by four or five large, uh, you know, crew boats, maintenance boats for a different industry. You know, it has a real potential of changing the character of those communities. And I just think that is something that needs to be considered, looked at, and those communities sort of consulted, uh, you know, about these kind of changes. This may not be so much a BOEM question as it is for developers who, who may want to come in, but, but I think that is a, a potential factor that could be quite important to those communities. Thank you. <clears throat> Gary, can I... I'll, I'll tee off of that to, to give a general response about some of the chat and comments I'm hearing and seeing. Um, the, so, some of the issues that we're bringing up today are on the near shore or onshore or you know, ports and harbors, for example. Uh, I, I know you all are aware of this, but I just wanna emphasize that um, we partner closely with the state, the state, uh, you know, and units of the state and counties and so forth will have uh, important roles in the overall process here. We will, of course, we're interested in hearing about this, but we will not be able to give a complete picture of all those things. Ultimately, when we get to that stage with the COP, um, we will need to uh, have our state partners alongside to help provide the, the complete answer to some of these questions about near shore, onshore kinds of issues. Um, so just wanted to get that out there for people who are thinking about those things and, and remind everybody that um, there are other, other governmental entities involved here that'll have to um, be along for, for this process to help everybody understand the full picture. Thank you, Rick. Makes sense. Louis Zim. Thank you, Kerry. And, and thank you, Rick, for, for what, what you just pointed out about, about the many different governmental agencies that will be uh, in, in, in the queue to, to try to answer questions about ports and harbors. I, I just wanted to point out uh, historically, and I know Don is familiar with this, um, what happened in the Santa Barbara Channel and off Arguello and Conception with uh, making harvest platform heritage and Irene, et cetera, and, uh, and how that all worked out. It uh, basically wor worked out with two harbors in the sense that there was Port Wainimi, which was much more of an industrial harbor. And uh, most of the operations, uh, support operations for the rigs based out of there, they were, the fishing fleet was fortunate in that Ventura Harbor was just a few miles away and the Army Corps of Engineers was able to, uh, to dredge it enough to allow the fishing fleet to, to really do most of its work out of there. So you had two harbors. Um, you have sort of the same situation up in Avila and Morro Bay. Um, Avila has a large pier, um, I think it's the Hartford Pier or one of the other ones that uh, used to take oil tankers. And then Morro Bay is a very restricted harbor with extremely strong currents. Um, and uh, environmental issues. So it'll be good to review uh, what happened there back when we uh, were making, uh, working the oil rigs. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Louis always has good uh, informative comments. Thank you very much. Um, Heather Mann, followed by Mike O. Thanks, Carrie. I guess I, I, I'm trying to think about how to phrase this because it's not meant to be um, combative, but 
you know, the comment that Rick made um, about having to rely on other partners to understand the full picture that Bohm is, um, I'm paraphrasing, but Bohm is, you know, that's beyond their um, abilities. I think it kind of gets to some of the, the frustration and the heartburn and the angst that those of us in the fishing industry feel because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, almost a lack of understanding about how fisheries um, work. And for example, whiting is a six month um, season, more or less starting in May. And it technically goes through December, but generally winds up, you know, fishing winds up ending in November because of weather and other variables. But whiting, helps maintain shoreside infrastructure at processors. And if for some reason the whiting fishery were to be um, you know, further constrained or you know, even eliminated or something like that, the downstream um, effects of that shoreside beyond the harvesters is huge because the processor loses um, the ability to potentially maintain their infrastructure 12 months out of the year, you know, ground fish and whiting are these, these fisheries that help them maintain their infrastructure for the pulse fisheries like salmon or shrimp or crab or tuna that they maybe couldn't do and exist um, on their own. So these things are all pieced together. And if you're eliminating or, or constraining or reducing some of those fisheries because of offshore development, um, the downstream impacts on the port could be significant because not only are you losing those direct fisheries coming ashore, the, the processors in many cases cannot maintain the infrastructure that's needed for the other fisheries and uh, or to keep people employed 12 months out of the year. And those processors are potentially also providing services for recreational fishermen with ice or custom processing. I mean, it's just a really, a really, um, it's a web, right? It's a, it's, it's complicated if you're not part of it, I guess. But um, you know, saying, well, that's somebody else's. Uh, you know, we're going to have to rely on other people. The decisions that Bohm is making are going to directly impact not just what's happening on the water, but how those, um, you know, how those activities translate on shore. And so I'm hoping that. Um, you kind of understand why it just feels, it, it gets frustrating that it's just not black and white, everything is connected. Um, and hopefully we can, we can incorporate some of those types of impacts into the, into the discussion. So um, thanks for letting me speak. Okay, thank you, Heather. Mike Okineski. Yeah, I'm gonna concentrate on some of that angst that Heather mentioned. Um, I, she hit the nail on the head, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but the one thing you're not looking at here is that uh, the things that Heather expressed and the backflow feed of what happens in the ports to the fishery people, the people on the water themselves. We are the first step in the marketing process and put a lot of work into that. Uh, and you're not going to take 300,000 pounds of hake and distribute it out to farmers markets on a local basis. There are some fisheries that are very successful selling off boats and and marketing locally, but there are others that, uh, but they're still, as Heather said, somewhat dep dependent on getting ice and whatnot from processors that need to have a, a economic, uh, be economically successful which takes the whiting, we've got millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds maybe, invested in our plants to do whiting. And if that goes away or there's an interruption of that, it's going to hit back on the boats. And the marketing side is another thing that you've got to consider in this. If you affect that, the market for the boats is in many cases, directly to the processors. And we, we, I don't consider us the market, but we are a conduit to that market. We're a second step in a supply chain and everybody's seen what's happened in the supply chains 
it's almost notable almost everywhere. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Oh. Um, okay. Well, we're still doing pretty well time wise. So there's a couple of people who um, wanted to um, make some comments that weren't, you know, directly, um, you know, aligned with uh, this meeting or this agenda, but um, that are indirectly. So I'm going to turn first to Mike Conroy. You have something to share with the group. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. And um, I'm probably going to hopefully call on either Lane or Fiona from Rhoda to explain <laughs> what I'm going to be introducing here quickly. They recently got funded for a census of the science workshop focused on floating offshore wind. And um, in anticipation of that leading up to that, they've sent around a couple of surveys to the fishing industry. Um, I'm going to post links to those in the chat, but I'm hoping that either Lane or Fiona can jump on here and speak more to it and describe it in far better detail than I could. Uh, that would be fine. Just keep it fairly succinct, please. Uh, this is Lane Johnston. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Lane. Hi. So I'm the programs manager for Rhoda and then my colleague Fiona Hogan is also with Rhoda. Um, and as Mike said, we have been funded to do a second synthesis of the science workshop focused on floating offshore wind development and fisheries interactions. So we're just in the beginning stages of getting that planned. Um, so you guys will obviously get notices from us when we have dates and structure ironed out. Um, but then also two things that Rhoda is working on right now that would be helpful for the commercial industry to pass around to their colleagues is uh, these two surveys. One is uh, requesting research priorities that the fishing industry thinks are super important specific to fisheries interactions with offshore wind. So we can really advocate for what the fishing industry thinks are the most important research areas to focus on uh, moving forward. And then the second one is um, there's a lot of different ways that compensatory mitigation or impact fees could be applied to fisheries from offshore wind development. And we're just looking for some feedback on what things work well for the fishing industry, in what ways could it be improved, um, different insights that many of you guys have from some of these discussions that you've been working on. Um, so yeah, if, if people have time to fill out those surveys before August 1st, that would be greatly appreciated. And anyone in the in any commercial fishing sector is welcome to fill them out. So that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike and Lane. Um, and I saw Mike posted the link to that survey um, in the chat. Um, Lane, so can anyone take that survey or only, um, you know, fishing industry um, related people? It really is focused for fishing industry members, but um, I mean, it's a public survey, so anybody can take it. And, uh, but we're really trying to get at the question of, you know, bringing the fishing industry concerns to the front of the table. Cause I think sometimes they, those voices um, might not, get <laughs> as much weight as some of the other ones that are floating around. But it is a public survey, so um, we just ask for your name and affiliation if you're willing to give it. And so we can uh, better synthesize the feedback we get. And the reports will be made public as well once we get all that information collated. Great, okay, thank you, Lane. Um, we have another um, comment. Rick, you wanted to share something. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you, Carrie, and everybody. Uh, thanks for your attention uh, for this very quick interlude on a totally different topic. Uh, while you're here, I thought this was a great opportunity. I know uh, some portion of you are interested in this uh, issue of decommissioning of oil and gas infrastructure in Southern California. And I just wanted to take this moment, since it's today, to announce that the, uh, we've kicked off a programmatic EIS to uh, study decommissioning of oil and gas infrastructure and the scoping 
uh, started today, as I said, and it'll be open for 45 days, just the very beginning of a process to a study decommissioning. So I'm going to post in the chat a link to our website, which will give you links to all the information available right now. Uh, so again, just uh, knowing some of you are interested, wanted to take just a moment to share that while we're here. Thank you. Rick, is that a generic EIS or is that for a specific uh, project decommissioning? It's a programmatic, so it is generic. It's out in front of the actual decommissioning projects that we expect in the future. And it's to uh, sort of take Sorry. on. Sorry, Sorry. you're uh, chopping off a little bit. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, it is generic and it's in front of the decommissioning applications that are expected in the future that BSEE, our sister agency, will have to consider. And it's to, to take on some of the uh, big analytical questions that are on people's minds, such as complete removal versus uh, partial or reefing, partial removal and reefing. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, Steve, I see your hand up. Steve Scheiblauer. Yes, thank you. Since we're a little bit on, on sort of unrelated topics, I just wanted to ask at what point, uh, or, or is there a point that BOEM analyzes the engineering around uh, these structures? I'm not sure if that's the BOEM function or whose it is, but you know, I, I hear the question quite often of uh, concerns about whether these things will either break loose or, or topple. In, in the most extreme conditions. And so I just wonder, you know, where, where is that in the bone process or, you know, the, the COP or, and who is it who would have the expertise to actually evaluate those, those questions? Thank you. I'll, uh, this is Nancy, I'll take a stab. Um, that will be in the construction operations plan, which will contain the method of construction operation and, um, you know, all the, the the information with regards to design will be in the construction and operations plan. Um, we do have an engineering review and technical branch um, housed in, in Sterling, Virginia that, that goes through and reviews all of that. There's also um, like design standards are continuing to be developed at the industry level with participation of BOEM and NREL and others. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work happening on, on the engineering front. Um, and all of that for our, our purposes won't really be um, in front of us until we have the actual um, COP submittal. Thank you, Nessie. Thank you, Steve, for the question. Michael Kaneski. Now, since Steve mentioned the engineering part of it, I'm just curious, can you still hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, if I lose you, I, I apologize. My internet's pretty unstable here today. But what are they going to be just continually improving? I would imagine they will be uh, these wind generator systems so that, like in 10 years' time, that the new models are, can work at a lot less cost or produce a lot more electricity. I've heard of some that are 50 megawatt designs and one, I guess, in Europe that they're talking about a gigawatt. Um, and if so, would these present ones that we're looking at now, and I don't even know what size we're looking at, say for the Morro Bay, uh, I assume somewhere between 12 and 14 megawatts, but would these become obsolete? And at some point, just like cars or anything else that gets new uh, design engineering that we would they'd be changing them out and be a decommissioning cycle or something. Uh, what has anybody looked at that? What's on the table here for the next 20 or 30 years? Uh, thought about this as far as because this is a pretty major project for getting them started, but also you know, change over to something that would be a, more efficient or cost effective or something like that. I'm just curious. Yeah, you know, and this is Nessie, we rely on, on NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, for trajectories in terms of cost and likely um, technology that will be deployed in the like, 2030 timeframe, which is kind of what we're thinking uh, we could be in, in California. And I will try to find a link to um, 
NREL's reports, and they also did a, a video. Um, this is something we worked with uh, DOE and NREL on, sort of give like an offshore wind 101. It, it walks you through, you know, the, the technology, the cost trajectories, um, and just kind of, you know, a lot of things about offshore wind. So I'll, I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat for all of you. Um, Thanks, but we're right now looking at, like, I think the, the cost projections are at the 15 megawatt turbine size. Thank you. Okay. Not seeing any more hands up. We we delved away from ground fish, but that's okay. We had uh, some extra time. So um, that's why we were able to um, go a little bit wayward. Um, all right, then let's finish up this agenda item. It's 10.32. Um, we are scheduled for a 15 minute break. Um, I'm gonna guess that people would uh, rather finish up the whole meeting a little early, you know, rather than take a longer break now. Um, if someone, you know, strenuously objects, then um, speak up, but I'm gonna suggest we just keep ahead of schedule. Um, and we're not that far ahead of schedule, but a little bit. So why don't we take a 15 minute break and uh, come back at 1048. Is that right? Yes, you can do math. So 1048, we will resume uh, with highly migratory species. See you then.
Okay, one minute, everybody. One minute, and we'll get going again. All right, let's get going here. I will put up what should be the summary point for HMS. There we go. You should see that on your screen. Um, so we'll go through the same routine here. Um, just do a quick check. Okay, it looks like we're good to go. Um, Okay, so um, from yesterday's HMS discussion, and I'm really flying blind here because I was not here for this, um, but thanks again to Bianca uh, and her notes. Um, we have uh, four bullet points and then I'll ask uh, everyone else if they see any more uh, that are missing here that are specific to data gaps, um, data sources, um, you know, studies that should be or have been done, that sort of thing. So uh, first bullet is that there's little information on the drift gillnet swordfish fishery, um, and you need to go back 30 years to see the past fishing areas. Um, bullet two is that uh, says that albacore ha hasn't been seen or haven't been seen for at least 10 years. And um, I'm pretty sure that refers to Southern California. Um, is there uh, observer data that goes back farther in time? I did have a sidebar conversation with Kit about that. And so we talked about this apparent northward shift or this you know, northward shift in the, um, in the albacore um, stocks. And there really aren't uh, landings to speak of, especially in Southern Cali California right now. Um, uh, then there's a point made about the drift gillnet fishery and these nets can uh, travel 10 or 15 miles a night and they take many hours to pull in. And so if you're drifting towards a wind farm, you would need to um, uh, pull up, start pulling up the net much sooner. And so it uh, creates a de facto sort of buffer or a closed area. Um, and there was a suggestion to look at the um, foot, this seems like a separate bullet, look at the footprint of the call areas compared with the uh, footprint of the fishery. And um, I know that's something that BOEM uh, has worked on in um, other fisheries and um, I'm not as versed with the HMS, but that was a suggestion that was made. Uh, and then the last one is, um, oh, that a five-year time frame paints an incomplete picture and we should go back 15 to 20 years uh, to look at landings data. So first off, what other major take-home points uh, regarding you know, data gaps and information uh, uh, am I missing from yesterday? If any. Steven Stowes. Hi, Carrie. Hello, um, Steve. For those of you who don't know me, I am the HMS Management Team Co-Chair. And uh, it seems like we might have got into a little bit of discussion of the swordfish fisheries um, uh, recent development of deep set and buoy gear is another method to target swordfish. And uh, I think there's a, a, there's a fair number of people who, maybe even Kit mentioned it, or who are assuming the drift gill net fishery is going to go away in the next several years. Um, I guess I just want to clarify that it's not really just about the drift gill net fishery, the drift gill net swordfish fishery, but also uh, where swordfish habitat is located. And uh, so, so for example, if 
the drift gill net fishery got phased out, the deep set buoy gear fishery expanded, then the same kind of issues would still be pertinent. They're not going to go away if the drift gill net fishery goes away. So I just wanted to bring that up. And there was also some discussion about um, deep set buoy gear and uh, how that might work in the vicinity of um, offshore wind installations. Uh, if I understand the uh, the offshore wind installations will be tethered to the ocean floor by cables, and uh, I, I assume if a, if a swordfish is on a deep set buoy gear line, that that line might move with the fish, and uh, I'm just wondering um, if there's an assumption that the line won't uh, somehow get wrapped around the cable, or you know what what assumptions are being made about the possible interaction between deep set buoy gear and uh, offshore wind. Thanks. Uh, okay, that sounds like a question that maybe Bohm wants to respond to and then I'll turn to Wayne Heikala. Hi, uh, this is Donna. I would say that uh, from Bohm, um, we aren't making any assumptions about deep set buoy gear. That discussion was like, <clears throat> uh, since it's a new fishery, it's unknown. Um, you know, maybe there would be discussions if that ever became um, something that was not a, an experimental fishery. Uh, if certain design measures could um, be part of a uh, of a offshore wind farm, so that. Um, it wouldn't inhibit deep set buoy gear uh, deployment any more than was necessary. So it's probably going to be very limited inside the uh, farm, but the, you know maybe there could be other options um, about marking and stuff that would limit you know what we would call the buffer zone around a wind farm. All these discussions are kind of difficult to have um, unless we have a, a, a specific project because as maybe many of you know and some of you don't, uh, the mooring design, you know, w is uh, highly variable um, depending on what pro the project might be and what the turbine foundation looks like. But it's just something that was kind of a sidebar conversation um, that we had. But I do have a couple of requests from uh, either NOAA Fisheries or PFMC and that is, are there any logbook data available that we can use from the drift gill net fishery or um, anything else that might be important in the HMS fishery management, management plan that we can use to quantify the offshore distribution of fishing? Um, does, first of all, does logbook data exist for the drift gill net fishing? And can we get uh, access to it? Has anyone worked that up? That would be important. Um, I know that there are logbook data for the albacore fishery, and some of that was worked up. We Right now, we only have the data offshore California, but it would be great to have like a comprehensive layer for the entire California current. Does anyone have those data? And if so, can we get a copy of it? Thanks. Hi, this is Liz Helmers. I don't have an option to raise my hand, um, but I'm with CDFW. Um, and we do have Gillnet logbook um, data that is available through the department. Um, there's also observer data for the drift gillnet fishery. And then in addition, I'm not sure if this has been mentioned or if you're aware, but um, recently NOAA staff and some um, Pacific States fishery manage or Pacific States fishery what am I saying? The PSMFC, um, they, some of their staff recently did an analysis looking at um, self-reported logbook data compared to landings data compared to VMS as far as location accuracy goes. Um, so that might be something that you want to look into as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Steve, um, again. Um, yeah, Steve, go ahead. I was going to turn to you. What, uh, be patient, Wayne. Sorry, we'll get to you. Sorry, I just had a, a couple of things to add to um, Donna's inquiry. Um, there is observer data that has been collected for the deep set buoy gear fishery as well, but uh, I don't know that it's uh, representative of the eventual extent of the fishery because it's under development. 
And then just one more quick thing to add to my earlier question about possible interactions. I don't know if this uh, is common knowledge, but the deep set buoy gear fishery was authorized with a five nautical mile um, diameter footprint. Um, and I believe the net length of a drift gill net net inside the uh, Southern California, well, inside 200 miles of the coast is 6,000 feet, a little over a mile. So I guess I'm just kind of curious, you know, if, you, if you're uh, introducing a new method with a larger footprint, I'm just kind of curious about um, how that's not going to potentially create a greater conflict uh, of using the gear in the vicinity of an offshore wind platform if it's presumed that a drift gill net with a much smaller footprint won't work there. So I don't have the answers, but I'm just uh, curious about that discussion going forward. Thanks. Well, thank you for the data. Um, as we pointed out before, we haven't uh, begun that kind of analysis yet because we don't have a construction operations plan. But all those data are really useful for us to help understand what an appropriate buffer might be. So uh, that's great. And if in the comments, whatever, you could put any kind of links to information that describe that, that would also be very useful. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Heikala. Yeah, Maureen. Um... Uh, just a comment on bullet point two there, Al Albuquerque hasn't been seen for at least 10 years, SoCal bite, and is there observer data that goes farther back in time? The, the Albuquerque troll fleets never had observers on the boats. So. Hey, Wayne, I'm sorry. Um, can you start over? You're kind of fading in and out. I didn't catch all that. Oh, okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that seems to be better. Okay, I might have had the speaker pointed the wrong way here, but on bullet point two, the observer data, there has been no observers on albacore fishing vessels, except for a few voluntary ones in the past. But uh, as far as the Southern California, we have a lot of data, uh, logbook data that goes way back that Southwest Fishery Science Center probably has in their files, especially prior to about 2008, when they stopped putting together the annual reports, one of those years. So there is a lot of data down there, uh, collected mainly from log books and, and uh, reports they did. So it is, there isn't a lack of it, but uh, there's no observer data. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, thank you. So the answer here is no. Um, Steve Scheiblauer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just got a text message from Tom Hafer, who's out of Morro Bay, and he wanted me to relate that, uh, you know, he's lived in that area for 50 years or so, and that he fished albacore very earnestly for 18 years, uh, right out of Morro Bay, and, and the area of the call area, he says, uh, was really a, an important area for them. And so it emphasizes, you know, enough reach back, and also, you know, the ability to, to forward look. And I think there's probably no getting around, has been, has been pointed out many times, no getting around actual interviews with fishermen to get their oral history of the, of the, uh, the areas that are important to them. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mike Conroy. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Just to kind of piggyback on what Wayne was saying about the lack of observer data, there might be some observer reports reports from the tagging studies that went on. Um, and I, I think the last one was done in, in 2018 or so. I could be wrong. But you know that would be another resource to look at. I think the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and others were doing some tagging studies using the albacore fleet. So uh, that might be a good resource as well. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, open it up, cast the net a little wider here and um, uh, open it up to you know more additions or questions or discussion about uh, any of these bullets. Okay, 
Gary Burke. Yeah, am I coming through here today? You bet. Good. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, the drift net fishery here, which I'm in, is uh, going to be one that's really totally affected by this. Uh, the uh, the fleet has gotten because of closures and all a lot smaller, and so a lot of the boats uh, that used to fish there are gone because the weather up there is not all as great as in the Bight. That's why you see a lot of the concentration in the last couple of years in the Bight. But if you go back to the history of the fleet, uh, that's a big area for us to fish. It's one of the better areas. We're still allowed to fish. We can't go above Point Sur until November 15th when the storms come in. But that area actually usually has larger swordfish than the bite. Uh, a lot of those fish come in from the uh, uh, Pacific to the, from the uh, West, and they're the bigger fish versus the ones that come up from Mexico. And there's a lot of, uh, seems to be more opa and uh, bluevar and tuna sometimes up there too, the bluefin as well as albacore in the past. And so that's why you'll see the, uh, the fleet that still has five or six of the bigger boats, they will wander up there as soon as they know or hear or they think there's any fish. And when one of them goes, there's uh, gonna be two or three of them. They all kind of go in a pack. And like I said, so if you look at the Observer Davids, uh, you know, if you see one up there, they'll be actually represented by three or four most likely. And like I said before, if you look in the logbooks, unfortunately, uh, you know, they may start off and fish in the bite and they'll move up. It might take two or three days to get up there and then they find the fish and might stay four or five, six days. So the log bait might even put down a different block. So uh, one uh, reiterate again that you need to reach out to the fleet. Most of the bigger boats are down in San Diego and uh, I would reach out to David Hayworth. He is kind of the leader of that group down there more so than... Um, what was mentioned before, Pete Hallamay, he's he's in the Fishermen Association, but David Hayworth is, he knows all, he owns one of the big boats actually that Arthur works for, one of the better swordfish guys, and he kind of runs and uh, he's he's also on the council on the CPS, I think, but um, you can get a hold of him easy and schedule a meeting with those guys. They will uh, tell you a lot of the history. A lot of them have been there for a long time, like myself. I think that'd be a good starting point too. So um, <clears throat> yeah, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Jessica Watson. Jessica. Hi, Carrie. Can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. Hi, uh, Jessica. Yeah, so I just wanted to bring up similar to uh, Lynn's point about recreational groundfish uh, efforts to also when considering um, specifically in Oregon, the recreational albacore effort and how we have information um, spatially a little coarser, as Lynn mentioned, um, when it comes to uh, both charter boats as well as private recreational vessels. And then also um, another contact um, with regards to HMS uh, logbook data could be the Eastern Pacific Professional Specialty Group, the EPPSG, which is kind of a group made up of NIMS, um, Pacific states, as well as state representatives with regards to data requests um, for highly migratory species. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, anybody else? Mike Conroy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. And just encourage Baum to reach out to the, and I think what, what Wayne said this earlier today, and I think we both said it yesterday, you know, with regard, specifically with regard to Albuquerque, you know, there are three, you know, WFOA would be a good place to reach out to, AFA would be another good place, and then the Washington Trollers Association get, um, their perspectives and insights. You know, many of the members in each of those groups have been around for quite a long time. And I think you'd, you'd get some, some very good, very valid data at having conversation with those folks. Okay, good. Uh, Gary Burke, back to you. 
Yeah, just another thing I forgot is that I don't think Deep Sea Set Buoy Gear is going to be able to fish amongst them. The, the buoys, you know, they got 10 of them up to five miles apart or three miles apart or four miles, and they drift a mile an hour. And when you catch a fish, it can tow even faster. You got all the lines coming down from the buoys. So I don't think uh, some, of, some of those sets of gear, you know, are worth a little bit of money. So I don't see uh, uh, those guys fishing in between them at all. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thought I saw another hand up, maybe not. All right, well, um, well Bohm, what, um, what do you see? And um, I apologize, you may have discussed this yesterday. Um, I wasn't here, but you know, are there any other sort of requests or what you see as data gaps that, um, you know, or contacts that would help you um, in refining these uh, areas? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. And oh, Frank, uh, are you there? Yeah, and oh. I would just kind of re repeat what some folks had said. If any anyone who's aware of data sets that are out there that you know that we don't have access to yet, that could be very helpful to us. You know, anything that's showing, you know, where the geospatially, you know, basically putting it out on the uh, on the ocean where the fishery has taken place over time, is going to be helpful to us. Yeah, uh, this is Donna. I've already made the statement if, you know, if there are logbook data, that would be useful. But uh, also, I, I know that some of these species, for example, swordfish and, um, you know, some of the other species, perhaps in HMS, there are other governing bodies that look at um, managing that fishery. You know, I can't remember the names, but they're international groups, right, because the fish range all, all across the Pacific. Are there any data that those other governing bodies use to describe the spatial distribution of fishing effort that you guys know of? I'm seeing no hands go up, Donna. Oh, there's one, Mike Conroy. Yeah, I was hoping that Liz or Steve or no, would would have jumped in. I, I'm I'm unaware that the RFMOs track the data down to that discrete level. I think they're more interested in the amount that is harvested and not necessarily the where. Within reason, uh, obviously, if it's if it's on the high seas, that may be a different thing in east or west of the 150 line. But and I see uh, the good doctor has raised his hand, so I will shut up. No, Steve, go ahead. Steve Stoves. Unmute. Can there you, you hear go. me? Yep, now we can hear you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, so I would say, Donna, the, the answer to your question generally is yes. Uh, that is, when there's um, a stock assessment conducted as part of the Regional Fishery Management Organization process, uh, they do consider the spatial distribution of the uh, stock that they're assessing. But uh, I, I'm going to back up Mike's point, which is uh, they, they don't generally look at the fine scale um, distribution of uh, fish habitat and uh, fishing effort inside the area where the um, offshore wind energy siting may, may occur. So I'm not sure that the, the kind of five mile high look at the uh, distribution of you know international uh, fishing effort and uh, stock distribution is going to be that helpful. And this is Liz. There's still no hand raise option for me. Um, but even even if they did look at a, a finer scale, um, the data they would use would be the data that we have available and provide to them um, from the US. So they don't collect anything additionally that we don't already have access to or that we can point you in the direction of. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. 
Thank you, Liz and Steve. All right, anything else? Fisheries that we're missing, experimental, deep set bu buoy gear, shallow set buoy gear, DGN, harpoon, time frame, log books. Ah, that stirred up a hand. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, sorry for monopolizing this conversation. Um, I would just throw something in here about anticipated expansion of effort in the, or potential expansion of effort in the same fishery for yellowfin. If the yellowfin continues to move further north, it may eventually overlap with the uh, Morro Bay call areas. So that that's something to, you know, we're looking at this historically, but we're, we're not looking at this, you know, my, my understanding is the shelf life of a wind farm is 25 or 30 years, and it's not outside the realm of possibility that 25 or 30 years from now there could there, there could potentially be a productive um, fishery for yellowfin and or skipjack in and around that area. Just something to keep in mind as well. Thank you. Okay, hey, anyone else? All right, and we're obviously including um, the public here because we're uh, time-wise we're doing pretty well. And um, so I'll uh, encourage the public to jump in here if you have some comments or questions that are relative to the HMS fishery. Okay, then we are going to move on here. Um, I think, what, let me look at the agenda here. Yeah, we're rolling right along. Um, it's 11.15. I mean, I guess we could go to a very early lunch, but I'm gonna, again, guess that people would prefer to plow through. I don't think we'll, be able to finish up the whole thing before lunch. Well, I know we won't, obviously, because we have another uh, substantial agenda item. So um, let's just move forward with um, with CPS, which was originally supposed to be after lunch, but now it's going to be before lunch. And up, oh, Steve Scheiblauer, go ahead. Yeah, Carrie, thank you. Just a maybe kind of a point of order question. So we've advertised public comments uh, separately at 2.25. Uh, are we committed to that, that we have to have that at that time, or are we comfortable in, in advancing that uh, you know, to an earlier time? Um, I'm very comfortable advancing it because uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of people that you know, are not on the call that are not gonna be on the call because they wanna wait till 2.25 p.m. Um, I'm more than happy to sit here with the, uh, you know, meeting open in case some member of the public does want to come in and put something on the record. No problem. But, uh, I'm, you know, unless, unless anyone on this call is objecting, um, I think we'll just push that ahead too. um, you know, at whatever time we get to it after the ecosystem and the habitat session. Uh, does anyone object to that plan? <clears throat> that is a good point. Um, and in our uh, council meetings, when we have our advisory bodies meeting, um, you know, during our council meetings, we uh, are generally obligated to be a little bit more um, stringent with where we hold public comment because, um, you know, when we used to be in person in hotels and, um, 
you know, uh, people will, will schedule their day to go to different advisory bodies and make their comment or listen to certain discussions. And it's really disruptive if they show up to give public comment and um, realize that we already had it. This is a different situation. So I think we're safe. Okay. I should, let's see what's on the screen. Huh? Let me get the CPS summary here. Okay, there we go, there we go. Um, so here's the uh, summary of coastal pelagic species. I included some of the discussion points too. Um, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of data gaps um, that were identified, a few. But um, some of the main points that we uh, hit during discussion were that the uh, fishing occur occurs near ports um, in, in times of low abundance. Um, and a lot of the time, especially in low abundance, is all in state waters. Uh, there's more squid fishing that happens in federal waters. Um, and when the sardines are highly abundant, which uh, happens um, periodically, they're definitely like the other CPS stocks, they're a boom and bust, and they spread all the way up the coast off of Vancouver Island and even into Alaska. So in, during those times, they're found farther offshore and there's a lot more landings that are farther out. Um, I think beyond, well, I don't know where the uh, call areas are yet off of Oregon, but um, it may be, you know, some of those landings occur in and uh, probably farther out than would be, um, you know, areas of other fishing and potentially of, uh, offshore wind development. Um, but that's not my wheelhouse, so I probably should not delve too far down that road. Um, the uh, sardines at a point helped fill big gaps in the processing plants uh, that made major investments. Um, there are infrastructure impacts, and this gets back to uh, something that Mike Okineski said and that we've hit on, and that is that, um, you know, if you lose a fishery, it's uh, hard to get it back. And it's, um, it's not uh, just hard to get the uh, fishermen back and the vessels back. Um, but there's port infrastructure and there's processing capacity uh, and that can't just um, be turned on like a switch. Um, but at the same time, the, um, the CPS fishery is, um, it's sort of a, um, uh, someone used a really, I think Donna, you used a, a good word to describe it where, um, you know, they'll fish for one species when it's there and then a different species when it's not there, which happens a lot, you know, the, um, if, uh, you know, squid is the highest value target, um, then they'll fish for that. If it's around, uh, then they'll fish for sardines if that's around or mackerel or anchovies. Um, but it's good to uh, have the ability to um, jump to different target stocks for the CPS fishery. Um, yeah, sardines are down now, but they, uh, when they boom, they can boom pretty well. Um, and there are reports uh, of sardine sightings, you know, and when they do expand, uh, there appear, there's uh, evidence of sardine spawning up in the north. Um, I don't, uh, and there may be some um, anecdotal reports of spawning uh, even during periods of low abundance. Um, encouraged to uh, speak with the fishermen uh, to get insights of how things have changed over time. And then for the data gaps, um, the logbooks, um, logbooks required for market squid need to look at the larger time frame for CPS fisheries. Uh, and there's not a lot of VMS data that can be made public due to the rule of three. Uh, that's definitely a problem. Um, you know, I, you can, um, I mean, a fishing vessel can uh, divulge its data if the, you know, if the owner um, wants to, um, but you have to go through a process to, um, you know, sort of voluntarily uh, provide that data. So that would be something that uh, the CPS, um, uh, you know, a fishing community would uh, need, or individuals would need to um, 
consider and discuss with phone. Um, but that is with that's with all confidential data. Um, you know, when it's confidential because of the rule of three, uh, an individual can uh, provide the data if they want. And you know, there's also uh, you know confidentiality access or confidential access that can be granted. So those are ways um, either around it or, or you know ways to address this you know, severe uh, data limitation because there uh, aren't very many participants uh, right now or not enough to be able to, um, you know, mask the individual data. So there's the broad brush overview. Um, anything missing here, especially related to data gaps or sources or needs or that kind of thing? Greg Kritzikowski, go ahead. Thanks, Kerry. Um, thanks for the uh, uh, great summary there of discussion and, and uh, data gaps. I, I would point out that uh, logbooks are required for more than just market squid. Um, there are uh, state requirements for um, uh, logbooks for all CPS fisheries in Oregon. I believe Washington has the same. I am not entirely sure about California or in the federal system, but we do have, um, uh, there's, there's a lot more than just logbooks for market squid is what I'm trying to say. And those data um, should be, uh, I believe can be made available it's just a matter of uh, making a request to get those data and uh, that sort of stuff. And there's obviously a number of different approaches to making those sort of data requests. Um, you know, it could go to the um, uh, Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team, which includes uh, state reps and federal reps, um, and they can then go to, you know, to, to through the processes that uh, um, do it. Um, you could also go straight to the state agencies. Um, uh, a lot of the, um, uh, I know that, you know, some of them, the uh, logbook requirements are state regulations rather than federal regulations. So um, basically what I'm trying to say is you want to make sure that you get all the logbook data that's available and know how to get it. And it's not all that difficult or shouldn't be. Uh, thank you, Greg. Yeah, I uh, wasn't sure what to make that, uh, that point either. I thought maybe it was a uh, comment directed at the market squid log, squid log books. Um, um, I hadn't reformatted these uh, notes. I thought we were gonna do this after lunch. So I had to sort of scramble there, but yeah, Greg is correct about the, um, logbook usage. So if anyone else, if I'm missing something, if there was some discussion about, um, you know, logbooks specifically for market squid, then let me know. Otherwise, uh, we can just clarify that point. Um, Steve Scheiblauer. Yes, thank you. I, I just want to uh, maybe clarify a statement in the first bullet that squid fishing occurs largely in federal waters. And at least by my observation in Monterey Bay over a long time period, that, that's not true. It's almost entirely in state waters and relatively close to shore. But you know, I have just a fairly small window on that fishery that I know it happens elsewhere. And so uh, you know, maybe there's more to be said about that. I'm not sure if there's any squid people on, the, on this call as well who might chip in with that, but uh, I, I do wonder about the federal waters thing. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, there are some uh, squid people, uh, CPS people on the call. I see them raising their hands. Um, my understanding is that uh, some substantial portion does occur in federal waters, um, you know, definitely more so than the uh, CPS finfish group. But let's turn to um, Mike Conroy. Did you have a comment about the squid fishery? I did. Um, I'm kind of going to bolster what Steve had to say. Um, oh. There are, with a caveat, there are times when there have been significant catches well offshore. I'm thinking back to, God, I don't even remember what year it was, 
but there was a significant amount of fish harvested at the 43 mile bank, which is, as you well know, well outside of state waters. But by and large, most part, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bolster what Steve said. Mo most of the activity that takes place in that fishery uh, will occur in state waters. Um, I'm going to say, Nick, you're listening. Text me if I'm wrong. Um, and then I did want to move on to a, a point that Nick had texted me and wanted me to make sure that I asked Nick Jerlin, who is, who is, I believe he's still on the CPSAS, but um, he hasn't heard anything with regard to plans for accidents or retrieval of damaged equipment. Um, I think that's with regard to mitigation efforts. And I think he was referring to what was implemented in the Catalina Sea Ranch project where there was a lost gear, a lost fishing gear mitigation program. Um, is there petroleum lubricants utilized in the offshore wind farms? And what would a damaged transmission cable, what would be the impacts of those? Those are things that he wanted me to uh, relay and throw in there. But yeah, just, so take that with, uh, with a grain of salt, but also the, um, you know, my understanding from the squid fishery, and I participated in that fishery for a while, is that most of it does, in fact, take place in state waters. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Greg Kritzkowski. Yeah, I, I would uh, um, also say that uh, a lot, I would say probably the majority of the uh, 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 squid fishery that does occur in Oregon is uh, uh, occurs in state waters. Um, you know, obviously they're targeting the spawning um, aggregations, um, but uh, some of it does occur in, outside of three nautical miles in Oregon. And again, the Oregon squid fishery is um, uh, dwarfed by um, what has occurred in California. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Well, so it's a mixed bag one way or the other. I, um, the last, uh, yesterday I, or a couple days ago, I had a conversation with um, some uh, CDF and W biologists about this exact question, and um, you know, so that's where my understanding about uh, at least some portion, substantial portion of the squid landings in federal waters came from, i.e., near uh, you know uh, the offshore canyons and seamounts and things like that. But um, I guess you know at this point, it's we don't need to spend too much time on this. But um, it sounds like most is in state waters, but at least at time during times of low fin fish abundance, um, it's, there's more in federal waters than uh, with the fin fish. Um, okay, Yvonne DuBrenier. Yvonne. Sorry, that was an X, I'm clicking the wrong things. <laughs> Oh, so you don't have a comment. Got it. Okay. Who else? Anyone want to chime in here? Greg Kritzkowski. I, I would, um, you know, uh, want to speak to the uh, thin fish uh, thing, at least in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of the uh, thin fish are indeed uh, further offshore um, with, you know, the possible exception of uh, anchovy. Certainly sardine can be in state waters, but uh, certainly Pacific mackerel, I mean, and, you know, some of them come in closer to shore, but the majority, I think, of the uh, fishing activity that has occurred for sardine um, has been in uh, federal waters, not in state waters in the Pacific Northwest, is my recollection. Right, yeah, and I think uh, we had made that point um, that when sardines are in abundance, um, 
they are uh, spread, you know, far and wide and are fished for, you know, that's where that 20 to 40 miles came from. That is in re reference to the uh, sardines, um, not the squid. But of course now there's no directed sardine fishing happening in uh, the Northwest at all. Right. Okay, anyone else? Data gaps, data needs, log books? Um, Carrie, this is Nessie. Um, maybe just, I don't know if this is a question or maybe um, looking to see if, if PFMC has an input. Um, it, it's really nice to, to get all the contacts and, and the groups that we should reach out to. And so I was wondering if you, you know, cause just from I think past conversations with with had when we actually go to the fishing groups um like you did before the call in california um you know for fishers to disclose exactly where they fish um you know that was kind of pretty difficult to to try to 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 get them to tell us where they fish and i understand that and so any thoughts on how when we actually get to the the fishing the fishers who has probably the best information, um, thoughts on how we can get what their information, their oral history into spatial data that could be used as a layer. Marco Kaneski. I assume you're looking for kind of an entry point to get, get to talk to the people that can give you the information, is that correct? Um, I think we were there, um, like in some groups in California, um, when we were, you know, in earlier on, um, and we've had conversations, we, we sat down with some of them. And I think that the challenge was, you know, we don't know what to do with, we fish here, we, we you know, we fish right here off the Mora Bay and not know where, you know what I mean? It's like, how do we, we put that into geospatial information that we could use going forward? Um, respecting the need to have confidentiality, which which uh, I can clearly understand from their perspective. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm assuming if you talk to individual fishermen and and they give you information, but you didn't use their name or boat name, that that would not violate confidentiality. But I think you're again, like uh, Heather Mann pointed out earlier. Uh, Fishing organizations such as Diane Plesner Steels, the Wet, Fru Wet Fish Producers Association, and, and Mike Conroy, of course, is an excellent contact. But I, I think you could set up some meetings or conversations, maybe not physical meetings, but that would give you quite a bit of information. I could be wrong, but uh, I know even at the uh, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel. We've got a number of fishermen there that I, I'm sure would, well, I don't know about being happy, but they would probably be able to talk to you and get you some direction. But I, and then your, your specific questions, if they're narrow enough, I think would, it would be more than just general conversation. So that would be my suggestion. You might try that route. Also in the Northwest, I'm just typing in the um, chat box, the name of our organization up there. We haven't fished up there for some time, but we still have access to the numbers and whatnot where a fisherman that uh, did belong to the organization and uh, for the Northwest fishery. So that might be another avenue to take um, and see if you can get some fishermen to talk to, but I, I think you're, it, I think you're going to have to go to that level in order to, uh, you know, get some meaningful information. Thank you, Mike. Um, and Mike, if you could uh, either put um, the those, the names of those organizations or contacts in the chat or email them to um, Nessie or to me, I'd appreciate that. We want to make sure that we... Uh... Yeah, uh, I will carry up for my own organization. I 
thought that they mentioned earlier they were having, or somebody was having quite a few conversations with Diane. If you need me to get that together and put it down again, then I, I will. But if uh, Nessie or someone can tell me that they're already got that information, I would suggest they reach back out to her. Like, just go ahead and put it in the chat um, and then we'll, you know, it doesn't hurt. Okay. We'll, we'll do, it might take me part of my lunch time, but yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike Conroy, followed by Trung Nguyen. Thanks, Carrie. I, I would highly encourage the folks from BOEM to attend the advisory subpanel meetings and engage directly with the AS members. Um, maybe even consider doing it a joint meeting with the advisory subpanels and the management teams. That'll put you in direct contact with folks who can get you to many of the associations and groups that have been mentioned uh, earlier. Um, I, and I don't know where Nessie, I brought this up before, but I know that I have and Trung, I apologize in advance, but especially for the fishermen in California, the, the last time that we were asked to weigh in on areas that were important to us, it was during the marine protected area development process. And it was those areas that were eventually by and large chosen to be protected. So, you know, th there is a distrust and I'm not saying it's a distrust with BOEM. It, th there's just a general distrust of revealing those areas for fears that those areas will end up being the areas taken. So, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that it, with engagement directly with industry, you'll be able to smooth that over. But that's, you know, un understand that background when you're coming to the table with, the, with those conversations. Thanks. Thanks, that's helpful. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Trung Nguyen, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Gary. No, no worries, Mike. I figured, I figured you were gonna bring that up. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, I just wanted to clarify some points that Carrie made. Um, the, in California, the fish tickets, the, the block locations, they're usually 10 by 10 nautical mile blocks. Um, with squid logs, they're going to be a little bit more precise um, since we collect uh, GPS coordinates on that. So that's there will be, be a little bit of uh, like um, resolution difference between squid logs and fish tickets or fin fish. So like uh, squid, oh not squid, sorry, uh, mackerel, sardine, and whatnot. Um, yeah, and then I think that's about it. Oh, and then also squid. Um, it can kind of be a mix. I think Mike mentioned this in the chat. Um, it can be caught kind of in federal and state waters. It really depends on where they are and kind of the quality of the squid too. So if the fishermen are seeing good quality squid offshore in like federal waters and they'll fish for that. So yeah, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Trung. Helpful. Okay, I put the California Wet Fish Producers Association in the chat. So there's one CPS organization, um, and that's uh, the one that Diane Fushner Steele is the director of. Um, and I, or Mike, or someone can put in some more. Mike, you should put in um, your organization, please. Uh, Josh Lindsay. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Gary. I think this has been generally captured by everyone, but just I wanted to maybe touch on it one last time. I mean, obviously, I don't think anything beats actually talking to the fishermen and, and getting their sense of locations. But as Greg has mentioned a couple of times, between 2000 and 2013, we have point set location data for Oregon and Washington. Um, and then as Trung was just highlighting, we have block information as well. And based on the sizes of some of these wind farms, that may be a good place to start. So for every landing, we have the block that the landing took place. And then for squid, there's some refinement because of the squid logbook. So um, I just wanted to re-highlight those because for, for VMS, it's it's not a rule of three thing. CPS vessels do not have VMS. So it's this logbook information and the fishing block information from California, I think is is really the place to start and then and then obviously talking to the fishermen. Thanks. But to that point, um, whether it's log books or VMS, which CPS fishery does not have, um, you still are subject to the rule of three, right? I mean, so, so you can't make publicly available uh, data if it only comes from two vessels or one. Yes, and that can be an issue that got brought up for maybe the Central Coast or Northern California Coast. Um, but 
you know, right now on the WFW and ODFW websites, there are the reports that have visuals of the points that landings information for, for those areas where we had many boats fishing. Okay, Michael Kineski. Yeah, I didn't mention that because we did yesterday, but uh, Josh brings up an excellent point. That would be a good starting point. And I think those are very accurate as far as fishing information goes, but um, obviously, or somewhat obviously, I think you'd want to talk to the fishermen as well. But getting started, Josh has hit the nail on the head. I think that's a good way to start. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Josh. Okay, anyone else? We seem to be winding down here on this topic. All right then. Um, let's see, it's actually, we're now right on time, I guess. Um, so uh, we will go to lunch then, and let's reconvene at 12.45. Um, and well, we're not right on time. I mean, we're ahead of time, but um, we're in time for lunch. So let's reconvene at 12.45, and we'll go to the Ecosystem FMP and Habitat. We'll have Kit uh, and Steve Scheiblauer provide the um, overview and summary. So this will be run a little bit more like we did yesterday. Um, and then. Uh, you know, let, we're just having one agenda item to hit those topics. Um, and then that's scheduled for an hour. Um, maybe we won't need it all, maybe we will. And then we'll go to public comment when we get to it, uh, if there is any public comment um, still left. And I did wanna mention that um, the notice and um, the FR notice, well, maybe it was just our meeting notice and the agenda say that um, we'll take written comment as well, which we will. If you want that written comment to be, I think I mentioned this yesterday, to be in the record of this meeting, then send it to me and to Nessie Sumite um, by the end of today, and then it'll go in the record of this meeting. Um, we just didn't want to um, you know, cut anyone out if they weren't able to attend the call or um, you know, had other obligations. Uh, and of course, we take public comment pretty much all the, or written comment pretty much all the time anyway. So um, there will be plenty of opportunities um, affiliated or associated with council meetings and BOEM, of course. Uh, I, I think that BOEM will take that written comment anytime and Nessie can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that one more time. Yes. Right. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. All right, well, let's take a lunch break and we'll see you at 1245.
Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Here we are at the uh, home stretch of this meeting. Um, thanks for everyone's uh, attention and sticking around. It's uh, hard to do these virtual all day, two days in a row, so I appreciate it. Um, the good news is we're a little ahead of schedule, so we knocked out the four um, regulatory FMPs uh, and had discussion on those. Um, and we are now moving on to the uh, ecosystem FMP and, um, and habitat. So uh, we have Kit Dahl and, um, and Steve Scheiblauer who are going to give brief overviews of those. So um, Nessie, unless you have something to add. No, I don't think. Okay, thanks. Uh, then why don't we go ahead and um, turn over to Kit Dahl. And Kit, you should be able to share your screen because you're a co-host. Okay, uh, thanks, Gary. I just have a couple slides here and I'll sort of give a super high level overview of our, uh, the Council's Fishery Ecosystem Plan, which they adopted uh, in 2013. And uh, it's in in the process of being revised, the ecosystem work group has been working on revisions to plan over the last couple of years and getting close to the finish line. Um, the, uh, unlike our fishery management plans, the fishery ecosystem plan is not uh, based on or derived from a statutory framework. Uh, FMPs um, are of course, uh, specified in the Magnuson Act, and uh, as a result, they it, they are frameworks or mechanisms to regulate uh, activity, principally fishing. The fishery ecosystem plan is is not. It's it's I guess the term of art that's sometimes used is an advisory plan, uh, meaning it doesn't uh, result in in uh, direct regulation of, of activities, but uh, is a way of um, bringing uh, ecosystem issues to the, into the council's process. So, um, oops, let's try that again. There we go. Uh, so uh, just a summary of the purpose of the plan. Uh, and again, as I just implied, uh, it's really intended to as it says here, enhance the council's species specific management programs with more ecosystem science, uh, broader ecosystem considera considerations and management policies uh, coordinating across uh, the council's FMPs and uh, in consideration of the California current ecosystem. That's the large marine ecosystem off our west coast and uh, it's the in the ecosystem context is, is kind of what we talk about and, and consider the, the area of, of, uh, uh, of focus. And then uh, number two here, again, sort of a similar statement, but um, it's to coordinate information across the council's um, fishery management plans uh, for decision-making within the council process. So, um, a little bit more focus on, on uh, bringing ecosystem considerations into the decision-making process. And also um, in consultations with other regional, national, or international entities affecting the California current e ecosystem or FMP species. So that certainly that consultation piece is relevant within this context um, with, uh, BOEM and uh, the wind en energy proposals. And then finally here, uh, identify and prior prioritize research needs and uh, provide recommendations uh, to address gaps in our knowledge in that regard. And then, um, so uh, with those broad purposes, there are a few processes that bridge the the gap, if you will, between the, the sort of policy framework and um, doing things. Um, one of the ma major ones is um, a really sort of a way of bringing eco ecosystem considerations into the council process and information. And this is 
the uh, annual ecosystem status report that's produced by the two uh, West Coast Fishery Science Centers. Um, and so annual report on the state of the California current ecosystem. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. It's delivered to the council at the, uh, every year at the March meeting and uh, has a, a whole range of status indicators for different um, aspects or components of the ecosystem from you know, the very, you could say, large scale of climate drivers, ocean drivers, both um, you know, um, at the basin level across the Pacific as, as uh, they influence uh, the West Coast or the California current ecosystem and more specifically to the California current ecosystems. Then a bunch of um, indicators um, under the category of focal components of ecological and integrity. So these are basically looking at um, indicators tied to um, different trophic levels um, uh, going from bottom to top, I guess you could say. And um, then uh, the third broad category are human activities. That includes tracking landings from fisheries, uh, some indicators looking at gear impacts on habitat, uh, uh, some uh, uh, indicators uh, continuing to be developed, I would say, to measure human well being or um, how uh, fishing communities are doing, and um, other measures kind of of the nature of. Uh, of fisheries from a, a social science perspective in terms of um, uh, concentration of activity or the distribution of revenue um, by harvesters and how much they're special, specializing um, in uh, or, or, or being more generalist in their um, activities and also looking at uh, across fisheries, sort of cross participation of uh, uh, across fisheries, and that 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 is a um, relatively new addition, I would say, to the to the uh, annual report. And um, uh, so the council does provide feedback. Really, every March, there's an opportunity for the council's advisory bodies to weigh in on uh, whether they think the indicators are useful, effective, accurate and suggest new areas or new indicators and also uh, really evolving since the inception of the plan or the implementation of the plan is a process um, so that the SSC, uh, the um, science center team that produces the report uh, typically will request review of developing methodologies that under undergird the um, indicators and the those um, are proposed for SSE review and that, and that um, sort of cements the, um, uh, that, uh, you know, it's sort of best science, if you will. And uh, so that occurs also on an annual basis and uh, part of the process of uh, further developing and continuing developing the status report. The other major mechanism are the concept of ecosystem initiatives. And um, these are a way of sort of more topic specific uh, endeavors to consider issues that are cross FMP and relate to ecosystem based management. Uh, when the plan was uh, adopted, there was a list of candidate initiatives that were put forward that for the council to choose from on a periodic basis and work work on for some period of time. And uh, so, so far, uh, there are two that have um, been completed. One that was looking at uh, protection of certain uh, uh, forage fish species, um, a way of um, sort of monitoring or regulating the potential development of fisheries on, on what are currently unfished uh, forage fish species. And um, the second one was a very comprehensive look at those ecosystem indicators in the um, 
and the annual report and, and an opportunity uh, to um, have a, a lot of input on those and propose new ideas. And like I said, that wasn't a, a focus, focused effort, but that the uh, status report is sort of continually in, evolving and developing. And so um, there are uh, uh, continued opportunities, I would say, uh, beyond the completion of that indicator. And then we've, we're sort of getting near the finish line on um, the third of the uh, initiatives that um, uh, the council has embarked upon. And this has been um, looking at uh, climate change and the, uh, uh, how to um, address uh, the effects of climate change within the council's management processes and also some attempt to consider how you know through the effect of climate change may have on fisheries how there are parallel effects on fishing communities and how the council might take into account those kinds of um, socioeconomic effects uh, in in their decision making and, and uh, uh, management uh, processes so uh, we're Prob probably looking, of, as I said, of that uh, finishing here in this year, September, it's kind of a final report will be delivered on that and um, probably will in fact uh, lay out a bunch of more possible work in this arena. And uh, so again, initiatives are typically um, considered either for, um, identifying new initiatives or if one if um, when we finish one up typically um, considering taking on a new one that usually happens March e each year so we'll see what happens in March in terms of both the existing list and potentially some new initiatives coming out of of um, the one we're just finishing up that that may have some actions that could be um, could be framed as future initiatives. So that's that process. And just uh, the last thing I'd mention is, because um, it, it seems probably relevant in this context is um, as part of the update of the FEP is essentially taking a chapter out of the FEP and creating a standalone document, uh, this guidance document on offshore non-fishing activities. So this is intended to be a, a way of alerting other um, agencies and entities um, about uh, the council's um, concerns um, uh, in terms of um, uh, activities within the California current ecosystem. So um, that conceivably, so that's uh, that uh, standalone document is in development and is part of this uh, update of the FEP. So we can expect to to see that as a revised version of um, <clears throat> this chapter, current chapter in, in the FEP um, uh, being delivered to the council. And uh, um, anyways, I think that's about all I have as an overview and I've probably talked too long as it is. So I'll, I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Kit. Um, any clarifying questions? Um, about Kit's presentation before we move on. Just raise your hand or jump in. Okay, then let's turn to Steve Scheiblauer, who will give us an overview of uh, the habitat issues. Um, I'm not sure what he has in store. Um, maybe a description of the habitat committee, but Steve, go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. And, uh, and thank you, Kit. And as you probably can gather from Kit's presentation, there are, you know, a, really a lot of overlaps between the ecosystem work and habitat issues. And, and sometimes the two committees meet together to go over those, those mutual um, items of interest. Um, I am Steve Scheiblauer. I'm the member of the Habitat Committee who's been nominated at least to serve on the Habitat, on the, uh, the council's uh, new ad hoc marine planning commit, committee that's being formed. I'm just gonna give a very brief uh, and generalized introduction to the Habitat committee. 
Uh, it's an advisory body to the PFMC and is comprised of representatives from all four state wildlife agencies, NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service and National Marine Sanctuary Program, the Interior Department's Fish and Wildlife Service, the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, and representatives from conservation, recreational, and commercial fishing, and an at-large representative who happens to be me. Uh, most of the members and really all the agency representatives have strong science backgrounds on this committee. The Habitat Committee provides advice to the Council on a wide variety of habitat related issues. The committee works with other advisory bodies, as I mentioned, on habitat issues, helps develop ways to resolve habitat problems and avoid future habitat conflicts, and makes recommendations for actions that will help achieve the Council's habitat objectives and the objectives of the Magnuson, the Magnuson Stevens Act. Uh, the Habitat Committee has provided comments and recommendations to the Council numerous times for habitat concerns and or the need for further research on offshore wind, offshore aquaculture, and wave energy potential projects. Even with the new ad hoc Marine Planning Committee, I expect there will be close consultation with the Habitat Committee as a whole to identify habitat concerns. The Habitat Committee has had presentations uh, several times uh, from BOEM on offshore wind uh, developments and also on offshore aquaculture uh, issues. Since 2008, the Habitat Committee has assisted the Council with early drafts of letters on offshore energy development topics. Seven letters have been sent by the Council, including to the U.S. Department of Energy, several to BOEM, the U.S. Minerals Management Service, and the FERC. These letters are all available on the Council's website under Habitat Committee. A partial list of council concerns or questions regarding offshore wind to these agencies include these, these items. Consultation with the fishing industry. Socioeconomic analysis of both the project sites and cable routes. Alteration in species composition and abundance in and around the project area. Underwater acoustics. Water column disturbance. Seafloor disturbance fish aggregation, attraction, and biofouling, electromagnetic frequency disturbance, fishery interactions and or collision potential with energy hardware, effects on EFH habitats of particular concern and EFH conservation areas, displaced effort effects, short-term, long-term, and cumulative effects on really all the above. Now, of course, not all of these items addressed in these council letters are habitat concerns, but many are. Certainly over the past two days, uh, we have received a lot of information from BOEM on its science studies on th these topics, and I personally have, have learned a lot from them. Uh, the Habitat Committee will drill into these studies to identify data or analysis gaps, if they exist, and work to identify any other concerns which should be brought to the council's attention. I expect that the Habitat Committee will be significantly involved in, in drafting council comments on the anticipated new Morro Bay call area, the Humboldt site assessment and its environmental review, and <clears throat> other places that are allowed for pu public comment. So that's my overview. Uh, again, pretty generalized. And I think there's probably some other Habitat Committee members here on this uh, Zoom call. So if anybody else wants to jump in and add some things that I've left out, please, please do so. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Steve. Any uh, clarifying questions for Steve? Okay, then um, let's open it up. You know, we don't have summary notes from the discussion, so you just saw the slides from 
uh, both Kit and Steve. Um, so let's open it up. You know, we're doing well time-wise, so I'd say we should open it to um, both advisory body members and members of the public for discussion. So fire away. It's obvious Kit and I have stunned everybody with the brilliance of our presentations. Karin, go uh, ahead. <laughs> I'll wade into the water. Good afternoon. Karin Brady, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I just wanted to um, raise a question that has been uh, brought up in the context of the Climate and Communities Initiative work uh, relative to council managed species um, just generally, which is that we anticipate that access to fisheries, meaning where species live and where they are accessible to fishing gear will change with climate and ocean change. And uh, we heard uh, that loud and clear as an existing issue with, uh, for example, the whiting fishery, um, but also the albacore fishery, uh, that these stocks really do uh, undertake significant uh, migratory um, distributional shifts and then with climate and communities um, discussion for anticipating more of that in the future and that being an ongoing management issue. So to me, how that starts to intersect with um, offshore wind planning is that the areas by nature are static and regardless of what's happening around them, once they're built, um, they're there. Um, and so changing distributions of stocks could overlap more or could overlap less with council managed species um, over time. So that's not a question. It's it's a point of observation. It's a it's a point of conflict, you know, that that we have struggled with within the council family. What happens if these species move to a place where we can't get them for some reason in an offshore wind farm is one of the types of places they might move to. Uh, and so my uh, maybe a, a point of discussion or a point of, of question for BOEM is how is that kind of thinking built into the BOEM leasing process? Where do those types of considerations come in? Um, and, and how can we engage in those discussions as a, as a council uh, in helping uh, plan for and mitigate those either in the short term or the long term? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Rick from Bohm, and I'm going to react to that and uh, please others join in for further thoughts. Um, you know, we, we do always strive. I, I think you won't be surprised to hear. We, we believe we uh, try pretty hard to forecast what uh, future conditions could look like as we do our analyses at every stage of the process and leasing A and the COP EIS uh, will both include that kind of forecasting to the extent that we can. When, when we do that crystal balling in our analysis, you know, our charge is, um, I think, pretty sensible. It, it, you would agree. It, it's, we uh, look out to the future to the extent that we think we can do some meaningful analysis. And we cut that off when we are finding that it's becoming just merely speculative and is not really going to be helpful for anyone because there's just too little known about those future conditions. When we're thinking about projects that have decadal long sort of uh, operational time frames, it does get hard to, to think about those longer term conditions when we're faced with things that we are today like uh, changing climate. Um, but, but we will uh, attempt to do those meaningful analyses to the extent we have the information that where we can do them. Um, and that plays into part, I think almost well, I won't say exclusively, but it is certainly the most uh, important when we think about habitat changes, because that's, you know, as you are well aware, that will sort of um, drive uh, 
with habitat changes, it will drive where we will see changes in um, occurrence, distribution, range, and all that of, of wildlife. Uh, so again, I assume none of that's a big surprise, just kind of putting it out there for what I think the bone process will be looking like. Your specific question about how to engage is, I mean, it's about where do we get that information where we can do that meaningful analysis. Um, and if, if you have thoughts or, or information that will help us as we do those NEPA documents uh, to share that will help get us there, that's, that's where we'll want it. Hi, uh, this is Donna from Bohm. Um, I have a few uh, comments that I'd like to have regarding that topic. And so um, one way that you can, um, the way that ecosystem group can provide information to Bohm that help would help us would be the, um, as Kit mentioned, there is an examination of climate change and what's going on in the ecosystem and how that affects uh, harvested populations. And so if that ecosystem group is doing any kind of projections into the future of how species distributions would change, uh, that would be very useful um, because we can use, as I mentioned before, species distribution models as you know potential fishing grounds um, uh, in the future and where that might change. Because regardless of whether there's a wind farm or not, uh, most scientists are predicting substantial changes to the environment due to climate change. And that would be the baseline that we would need for NEPA analysis to assess future impacts. So anything that the ecosystem group can provide to us regarding projection into the future of you know, projected changes to the fish population, that would be very useful. Thank you, Donna. Um, Yvonne, I see you. Uh, any follow-ups to uh, Donna and Rick before we move on? Well, this is Karin. I'll just add in um, that the council as a whole relies greatly on uh, the scientific expertise of the fishery science centers to give us that kind of information. Um, and the ecosystem working group and the habitat committee are uh, largely or greatly comprised of scientists. However, their role is not to do the analysis. And so um, I would just, uh, I, I suppose, tag the fishery science centers for that kind of information. And, and I understand that you are working closely with uh, NIMS partners already. Uh, and we've talked <clears throat> at the council about the need for uh, the fishery science centers uh, stock assessment survey uh, uh, routines or vessel uh, activities to, to still have access to those, those scientific grounds, so to speak. And um, in terms of species projections and changes, they're the ones who are uh, working on not only current stock status, but projected stock status uh, in response to climate change and other, other factors. So just, I suppose, for the record, that's, those are the, the folks who largely can provide those West Coast wide uh, snapshots and, and projections uh, both um, and, and hope and, and expect that you are already working with them on that. Yeah, thank you, Karin. That's Those are a couple of great points. And um, I can uh, affirm that, you know, we've always had a lot of touch points with NOAA and NIMS. Um, we have been uh, deliberate in trying to build and enhance those uh, even more lately to, uh, you know, uh, strengthen our responses and with regard to offshore wind and a couple of those areas you identified, the surveys and in the, the science outputs that they have are certainly two that are gonna remain on our list for talking with them. So thank you. Thank you, Karin and Rick. Um, let's go to Yvonne and then to Corey Ridings. Go ahead, Yvonne. Thank you. Uh, so Karin made one of my points, which was just uh, that the council committees themselves are not 
you know, data gathering committees, but we can uh, help you find the people and in, in institutions where uh, you can at least get an idea of what data is available. Um, <clears throat> I would just sort of add to Kit's presentation and to one of Karin's comments that the Climate and Communities Initiative um, where we undertook a scenario planning process to sort of think about how fish stocks and fisheries might react under different climate scenarios going into the future. Um, there was one scenario in particular uh, called the blue revolution scenario where we, uh, we imagined a future of um, many more offshore activities, including offshore energy and offshore aquaculture, uh, et cetera, than are existing now and asked ourselves, and by ourselves, I mean sort of the larger council family, um, how, how fish stocks and fisheries might react under that sort of scenario. So I just would mention that to BOEM folks in case they want to get some big picture thoughts on folks' concerns, uh, areas where we might see impacts. So not uh, not a GIS database that you can, you know, sort of layer on top of databases that you have, but some ideas of things that, uh, you know, directions to take future analyses. And then uh, I would also say that NOAA, you know, we're, we are, we would also like to have lots of great data about um, fish distribution <laughs> and we don't always have it. And we're sort of um, taking away one species at a time, which is um, perhaps could be more efficient, but, uh, but it's quite a lot of work to get it right. And um, as the folks from BOEM know, we've got a lot of different people in our science centers who are working on this. And um, we may not have perfect information, but we have seen some rather extreme climate events in recent years. And I guess I would look to uh, the years of El Nino's and marine heat waves as a sort of, we've been calling those um, climate stress tests. So, you know, in the worst years that we have now, are those going to become the norm of the future? So just a couple of thoughts to throw out there. Thanks, Yvonne. Let's turn to Corey Ridings. Go ahead, Corey. Hi, thanks, Carrie. Good afternoon. Um, Donna and Rick, this is just a little bit of a follow up um, to what you said in response to Karin. Um, thinking about the change that uh, happens in our environment already, but is likely going to continue um, faster and harder under climate change or other things we can't foresee. Um, even with the best modeling, which we have a lot of really good models. Um, our scientific community is incredibly brilliant this way. And we have entire ecosystem models that can put um, sort of everything that you could possibly think of in. And yet they can't answer every question. They can't make predictions. Um, and Rick, I think you even said it, crystal balling. So what happens when 10 years from now um, and we, we have these wind farms in place and we see something, something happens that we couldn't predict and that the, we need access to that space now and we don't have it. There's been an environmental shift where suddenly that habitat becomes critically important. Um, what happens then? Is there like what kind of monitoring? I think I saw in the comment box from Dr. Stowe's that you know what sort of monitoring is gonna happen, but what does BOEM do then? Is there ever the possibility that these facilities get taken out sooner rather than later because there's a need from other stakeholders? Thanks, Corey, <clears throat> for your comments. Uh, you know, I um, un understand what you're getting at there. I think that this is a problem whenever you're talking about infrastructure that has the potential to have a very long lifespan. This is well, not a new problem. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, I, I can say 
there will be, I, I have no doubt, some sorts of monitoring that uh, on the projects, but I, uh, I guess I could ask the RES people to comment on what leases might look like with regard to stipulations, but uh, I wouldn't anticipate that there would be um, a lot of very clear sort of drivers that would indicate, you know, some major change, of course, like I think I'm hearing you suggest like removal, you know, early project removal. Um, I, it's just hard to imagine what a scenario could look like in, in, in that regard. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I just, uh, I'm not thinking of any good examples right now. I'm trying to think on the fly of <laughs> trying to relate this to other areas, but um, I, I guess that's the best I can do. Not, not a great answer for you, but um, uh, again, my, my summary would be, doesn't seem likely to me that, that there would be a change of course quite that um, profound. And I guess with that, the only other thing that we could add, if it's helpful, I don't know, Nessie, if there's anything about the structure of leases you want to talk about and how they uh, deal with future conditions, because I'm not aware of what, what they might say. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add to what Rick said. I mean, you know, other than as likely as he said, there'll be like monitoring conditions um, in our stipulations um, that would attempt to address, you know, what we that could have what could happen in the future. But um, you know, the lease is granted um, for a term, um, you know, and it gives um, the lessees and the, you know they they have power purchase agreements. They have agreements that rely on the um, the lease. So, you know, there are, they're, they're going to be um, monitoring or, or things like that, but it, it can't really be an open-ended lease. Arn Brady, go ahead. Yeah, so a couple, a couple of thoughts. So I came up with a scenario, Rick. <laughs> it's out there, uh, but that uh, I'm getting, I'm getting better at, at that through the work that the council has done with scenario planning. Just trying to reach for extreme examples, just to talk through a point, and um, you know, a scenario that I can come up with that would affect um, council fisheries indirectly is if climate changes and a protected species of large whale, their favorite feeding ground is right in the middle of an offshore wind site and they start getting entangled there. And because of the entanglements, the impacts on that species then constrain fisheries even more than they do now. Um, and so there's both a biological impact as well as a fisheries related impact, something like that. And granted, that's extreme, however, um, we've seen extreme events that we couldn't predict, we couldn't really conceive of in the last 10 years. Um, so we're, we're living that um, kind of outside of the box scenario right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's just, that's one idea is a, a super extreme event. And, and I think <clears throat> that it, it, before, before you choose to talk about that or not, and, and, and I'm acknowledging it's out there, um, that the comment um, from Nessie about, um, you know, what, what might be required of lessees or not, and how that would affect that one installation. I think a, an expanded question on that is if we don't require significant monitoring on the first offshore wind development, how are we going to learn whether and where we want to do additional ones? And so more, more than just informing the lifespan of that individual site, I hope and encourage that kind of learning 
about any site that goes out there because as the years progress, we're gonna continue theoretically to get requests for additional sites. And yeah, so how and do we learn from what we've done and what, what we've, where we've made mistakes unless yeah. we require that learning? No, great points, Karen. I, to, uh, in reverse order, the, the second thing about monitoring, I'll say, you know, I, because of the um, uh, circumstances around offshore wind development and emerging uh, sort of technology, emerging geographical uses, uh, all, all of the new, I guess I would say about these projects, there's been a lot of interest in monitoring. Um, and I would say to the extent that we've gotten projects approved and know kind of what the future might hold for monitoring, I, I, it looks to me like there's quite a bit more being called for than there, there would be on, for example, similar onshore types of projects because of all of that novel, the novel issues. Um, the Renewable Energy Program in the Atlantic as an example uh, has devoted quite a lot of money to a research project on monitoring the call rodeo. Um, we've actually uh, tagged into that a little bit as well. And, and I expect that to continue and probably to grow as projects in the Atlantic and perhaps on the West Coast. I do think there's gonna be substantial monitoring. Um, and your earlier example, I, you know, I, so, so I won't address it specifically, but I'm glad you brought it up because it really helped me put some more texture around the question. And I think that I can offer some more information that could help people kind of understand what could play out in the future as new impacts are discovered. You know, there's a lot of, both through the NEPA review process and all of the other agencies that have a regulatory role and the consultation processes that we have, and perhaps the most straightforward one that probably a lot of you are already familiar with would be Endangered Species Act consultations. You know, there's a lot of reopeners, uh, you know, circumstances that can cause, you know, reopeners um, if there's any federal action, especially. So, you know, there, there are points at which check-ins can happen. I, I, that's kind of generic, but, you know, it's, it's kind of on a resource by resource basis. So, I, you know, it'd be hard to get into much more specific, but, um, uh, I don't want to annoy everyone by keeping putting off more specific information, but a lot of a lot of this would become more clear as we get to a project review and start getting into those consultations and see what sorts of issues could be at play and and who's involved. So, but but definitely there there are certainly circumstances that can lead to sort of reopeners of review and reevaluations of potential impacts and and uh, adaptive you know adaptive management sorts of responses. Sorry, I feel like I'm maybe going on too long and a lot of people want to speak, so. Uh, That's helpful, please right? Carry on. No worries. Um, let's go to Steve Scheiblauer and then Steve Stowes. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is kind of a technical question that, that relates to this conversation. Uh, how mobile are these turbines? Uh, could they be moved? Would, would they be likely to be moved uh, regularly into shore for maintenance, into a harbor area for maintenance, and, and or if the sites prove problematic, such as what uh, and we, we've heard about earlier, uh, could they be moved to, a, to a, another location? You know, and of course, I know there's transmission issues and what have you, but, but are they mobile enough that, they, that that's a possibility? Thank you. Um, well, this is Nessie. I will try. Um, I mean, certainly they're floating, but it's not like you can, you know, put them somewhere else because, you, like you said, easily. Because, as you said, there are cables. Um, you know, there's going to be a watch circle in which you know the it'll shift a little bit um, as it is floating, but uh, you know, it's not mobile that you can just move it from one place to the other. As a follow up and out of curiosity, would they be likely to be moved into shore, you know, every five years or something to for maintenance or is that maintenance going to be done outside? Uh, I don't have and I don't want to misspeak. Um, I don't have the specific um, information of frequency of uh, O&M activities right now, but we can certainly follow up with that. I mean, there are some things that they could do remotely. 
um, or you know, just for ease, just bring the um, the equipment or whatever the service vessel or whatever they need to do to to the turbine itself. Um, but uh, I'll see if if I can find anything more and follow up. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Nessie and Steve. Uh, Steve Stowes and then Mike Conroy. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, well, uh, I, I kind of posted this comment to the chat, but um, uh, fisheries off the West Coast um, oftentimes use observer programs to document protected species impacts. And I was curious whether there were any comparable um, data collection plans for offshore wind energy um, for their possible impacts on sensitive species, um, or is it assumed that these impacts will be negligible and hence don't require monitoring? Hi, this is Rick again, and I'm really sorry. I didn't hear the I didn't hear the first part of the question, so I'm not sure I understood at all. If you don't mind repeating. No, not at all. <clears throat> yeah, and I also posted this into the chat a bit ago, but uh, I was just um, commenting that our fisheries off the West Coast um, oftentimes use onboard biological observers to document impacts on uh, protected species if those occur. I was wondering if there was any um, comparable data collection plan to uh, try to monitor the impacts of offshore wind ener energy uh, installation and operations on sensitive species. Gotcha. Um, thanks. Uh, so um, there's two parts to my answer. I'm hesitating because I want to form this correctly. So on the Atlantic, where they have some steel in the water and state waters, at least with the Block Island project, I know um, the there is some monitoring there. But since that's a state project, it's it's not our program that's that's leading it. Um, and but I can say that I I expect there is going to be uh, a number of different types of monitoring uh, for both. You know there will be pre-construction sort of site uh, characterization, which we talked about. During construction, there will certainly be. And then in the operations phase, I, I believe there will be two. The second part of the answer is that um, since we don't have those that infrastructure in the water yet, we're, we're thinking about what types of things might be appropriate and what might work. And we've even got some studies proposed that are uh, looking at different types of uh, equipment and whether they'd be effective in monitoring for um, wildlife, particularly with birds, for example, that's something we're looking into quite a lot right now. So yeah, I, I do expect we will get there. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, let's go to Mike Conroy. Thanks, Carrie. Um, and this is probably a question for Bohm. You, you know, we've been having the industry has been having conversations about this now for about a year and one thing we keep getting wrapped around the axle on is this this depth limitation of 1300 meters you know it seems to to many of us that a lot of the impacts could potentially be mitigated just by moving these things further offshore um i guess we we're having problems understanding what the technological limitations are that that nest this at 13 100 meters because of the floating infrastructure portion of this. It just seems like the only technological constraints there would be is that the, the tethering systems. I mean, clearly there's going to be an added cost with longer transmission lines and the like. But um, I guess if you could address that, uh, why that 1300 meter number is is the quote unquote magic number. Thanks. This is Frank, I'll take a little um, a shot at that. One thing is that at 1300 meters, not only does it get deeper, but we're, the reason for choosing that is it's on the slope edge. So now we get, we don't just drop off to 14, we tend to drop 
quite deep. So it's, it's a really big change. We hit a slope right there where it's very difficult to, uh, you have to put hook, hook up anchoring systems or anything like that. And where there, you also get to a lot more uh, species issues, where it gets steeper, it tends to be hard, and hard is often places for corals and other sensitive species. So it gets to that, and it's not just we go from 13 to 14. We tend to have a a much bigger effect than that. And so far, you know, they haven't been in any depths near that. So really trying to push them so deep is a gets to be a, a tricky question. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Frank. Um, I have a quick question and you've probably put this in at some point in the presentations. What is the uh, standard uh, lease duration for these wind farms or the range? I believe they're 25 years. Doug can correct me. Yeah, this is Doug. Their a standard lease would be for 25 years operations term. Got it. And then um, assuming that uh, they're functioning well, have been maintained, then they would apply for a, a, renew, a renewed lease like a hydro dam or that kind of thing. Is that correct? Or I guess then the flip side of that question is what's the life expectancy of a wind farm? I, I think that the, you know, just from uh, general industry knowledge, I, I think that's like at least 30 years, but, um, you know, it, I think it would depend on um, the technology, but typically these power projects, I mean, as you've seen, you know, at least 30 years could, because they would design it for the term of the loans and loans are, you know, the, the debt on all of these could be at least that long, so. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for hands. And we're, uh, I'd say, let's open it up to, oh, there's Yvonne. Go ahead, Yvonne. Pardon me, there was one thing that did occur to me um, is maybe uh, in terms of bycatch or effects of, um, installations on protected species, you might want to talk to folks in the states and in NIMFs who are involved in bycatch reduction engineering. And um, because, you know, we've had a lot of success on the West Coast over the years of um, just of shifting the the technology, the fishing technology in, in different ways, either a hook type or the shape of a trawl net or, or lights that are used or not used to affect different species. And um, it probably wouldn't give you ideas directly on what to do, but it might give you some thoughts on how some of these structures could be tweaked or whether there are certain color lights you could use or whatever that might have uh, greater or lesser effects on our species. That's an excellent point. Uh, ways to minimize bycatch reduction, entanglement, entanglements, bird interactions. Good point. Uh, Arlene, and then Mike Conroy. Yeah, hi, thanks. Can you hear me okay? I know you couldn't hear me very well last time. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. You're a little bit sort of muffled, uh, but I think if you, you know, speak into the mic or loud enough, it's fine. Okay, I'll try to talk louder. Um, so I just wanted to mention from the habitat perspective, um, for the, the Council's groundfish EFH review process, um, that process did generate a lot of, of data and, and synthesis analyses that may be useful to this process. Um, NIMS in particular did a synthesis analysis and, and a, there's a report, there's data layers, um, that included species habitat suitability map layers for several of the groundfish species. Um, 
as representative for most, you know, they chose species that were representative of most of the species in the groundfish FMP. Um, NOAA also contracted with um, an independent um, team to develop habitat suitability maps for deep sea coral species. And in addition to the individual observational data that the deep sea coral program um, provides publicly, and I think is included at least in the Aura Wind layer map, uh, map tool. Um, they also summarize that information to one kilometer grid, grid to one kilometer grid for presence and abundance um, for two different time periods. So that information might also be useful. Um, and then there's also the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey data that includes bycatch data for deep sea coral and sponge species. And that is also you're, you're summarized to a, bit. a grid. OK. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here with my Use your opera. My Sorry about that. OK. Yeah, OK. I'll try. That's it? Uh, and then just one more. OK, good. And there's one more point um, to make just is that the, the seafloor data that is the coastwide data set for the West Coast, um, that data set actually has more detailed habitat classification information um, that would be more descriptive and more ecologically meaningful um, that could be applied you know, to this process and would hopefully inform the, the call area process as well as um, during the assessment of different lease areas. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Arlene. Go on to Mike Conroy and then Steve Scheibauer. Thanks, Carrie, and apologies for talking so much. Um, I hadn't planned on saying anything else, but Yvonne brought up a great point. You know, we've seen how successful things like acoustic pingers have been in reducing interactions with uh, cetaceans in the drift net fishery. You know, my concern is if, the, if similar actions or similar types of things are placed within the wind farm fields and it results in changing the migratory pattern of humpback whales, blue whales, or other listed species such that they become more likely to co-occur with, in this case, the California Dungeness crab fishery, it could have profound impacts on the ability of that fishery to operate. So, you know, although while we saw yesterday that the, the commercial Dungeness crab fishery is not one that's likely to be directly impacted by the footprint of the call area, it's these kind of unintended consequences of placing a wind farm where it could, that it could have profound impacts on that fishery. So just wanted to throw that out there for consideration as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Steve Scheiblauer. Yes, thank you. And, and to add on to Mike's comments, uh, forcing whales out into the shipping lanes and the shipping lanes are likely to move also would be another uh, unfortunate consequence that it's possible. But my question here is, is really when you envision a, a large wind, for, uh, wind farm, 300 turbines or so that could happen off of Morro Bay, um, has there been any discussion, any scientific work about reduced wind velocities uh, down project from that? I know that there was some work out of Europe that, that documented uh, significant wind lowering of wind speeds um, you know, down coast of some of their projects. I don't know how that compares with what could happen here. And, and certainly the bigger question is whether it would have any effect on upwelling, uh, regional upwelling. And so, you know, you know, Balm, if there's any work that you've done on that or have any answers to that, I think that's another question that's kind of a combo habitat and ecosystem uh, question. Thank you. Quick response to uh, both of those points. Thanks, you guys. Um, the uh, you know, I'll just say message received on the potential concerns about the pingers on for, you know, uh, marine mammal deterrence. I, it, you know, we're a ways out from that level of detail, but I'll say that um, we're doing a lot of work because entanglement is obviously, you know, one of the things that people raise frequently about uh, potential concerns. I, I think that 
uh, we have some things to learn and we have been learning. We've been putting quite a few studies as well. And I think that we'll be able to provide quite a lot of information here that will be helpful for people to understand the, the kind of the scale of the infrastructure and how um, I, I think we're gonna find that most of the infrastructure is not, does not have a large potential for entanglement issues. Um, but anyway, uh, like I said, message received and thank you for those comments on those. Um, the uh, second point about uh, air velocity, I, it's, we're aware of this and I, I know that we're aware of the studies um, in, from Europe. We have considered funding some studies here to try to figure out how to model some of this, but you know, without um, any of our own large wind projects in the US, we, we don't have anything to, to work from to try to, to to get any of our own information. Um, but like I said, we we are aware we're thinking about that and, and we're trying to think of ways to figure out how to model using maybe some proxies or something. But uh, again, we, we heard that. Thank you for the comment. And this is Susan from Bohm. I'll just chime in real quick. Thanks, Rick. Um, there's actually a study funded by the California Energy Commission looking at upwelling that's ongoing right now. Um, I don't have offhand when those results will be done, but they're looking at um, modeling the potential for offshore wind and how that may or may not affect upwelling. Thank you. If I can add to that, there, I've also heard concerns about changing wind velocities and, and potentially even weather and moisture and weather and what have you on the land side uh, down with the project. So hopefully some of these studies will also be looking at that too. Thank you. Uh, sure, and this is Susan again, I can um, chime in on that there. We have looked at some studies and so far, um, as long as the wind turbines are spaced a certain distance apart, um, the wind velocities uh, regroup and stay the same uh, at a certain part uh, downwind of the farm. So once it goes through the farm. Uh, so we have looked at that and there was some preliminary research funded by the California Energy Commission may have been 10 years ago now, but some preliminary modeling um, showing that actually there wouldn't be an effect, uh, but we are still interested um, you know, in more research on that end. But so far, those are the, the initial results. Thanks. Susan, there might be an effect, but not an impact, right? Uh, correct, thank you. <laughs> I heard you, Donna. Um, yeah, uh, something uh, was, uh, you know, digging in my memory too. I thought that I read a study as maybe one of the uh, EISs either for uh, Vineyard Wind or Cape Wind. This is a little while back, but I thought that I saw somewhere there that uh, basically, um, you know, concluded exactly what Susan said, where there, there is a decrease. It was like 3% of the wind energy in the uh, area of the individual windmill is lost, but then it is recovered um, by the time, you know, if you space it properly to the next windmill. But I don't have a citation for that or anything like that. Um, Mike Okineski. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, knowing that the wind doesn't blow all the time and lot of areas that, uh, and also this deficit that's maybe created or at least shown to be created um, in the European studies, if that's the case, if there, how much redundancy you have to have and in inter interconnection, I guess, amongst all the power sources for say a area of California, if it all of a sudden doesn't say it's the 399 section they just don't get any wind for a week or so. Uh, where you're going to collect your power, or is there kind of a redundancy system? So you build more than you need, I guess, if you're if they could run at maximum power all the time. And then since they don't, uh, you build more wind turbines to take up that uh, slack, I guess. And at other times you throttle back when it's everything's blowing all at the same time. Is, how does that uh, organization of power source to need a, on shore take place or has that been considered at all? 
I would imagine it is if you're thinking in terms of big events and how much one wind farm is going to produce over the course of a year, how much power. So this is Susan from Bohm, and I can try to address that. Uh, we funded uh, Cal Poly, and they published a few studies on the offshore wind resource and how much power it would produce for a hypothetical wind farm. And they found that the wind is pretty steady throughout the year. It does decrease at certain points, uh, but it's steady and stronger um, than the onshore wind sources. Thanks. And you know the control mechanism and the operation strategy. I you know in, in terms of grid delivery, I think that we will learn more about when they submit the operations plans. But but be aware, we're this is not our primary business in Boeing. We're not the uh, power transmission planners. There's uh, some other entities that really um, do the heavy lifting on that side. Thank you. Anyone else? We're opening it up here at this point. Lynn Mattis. Hi, this is slightly different tact or track, but is there, will these companies be required to have some sort of insurance or bonding so that say you're 15, a company goes bankrupt and then there's just a platform sitting out there. Is there some sort of, I guess, insurance to deal with that, that if the company is no longer viable, that that's not just left out there and becomes, you know, part of our dystopian scientific uh, sci-fi movie future. Um, yes. Uh, prior to any start of any construction, the lessee has to provide financial assurance that will cover decommissioning costs. And BOEM uh, may look at that, the adequacy of, of that financial assurance over time. Thank you. You. Good question. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Mike Okoneski and then Bob Dooley. Mike O. Sorry. If you were to do these studies and come up with a conclusion that there's very little fishing that takes place between 1300 and 1400 meters, or at least the vast majority of it is, takes place inside of that or outside of it, uh, would you then make a recommendation that in order to avoid uh, conflicts, which I think is one of your lists on your list that you gave me an essay of the 12 items, to attempt to avoid conflicts, would would that be a recommendation you might entertain then to put these things out farther, the wind turbines and farms, and in areas where they would not affect fishing? And I'm not even talking about decision making. I'm just talking about recommendations. Um, I'll I'll let Rick chime in, but I mean just so that you know, like the way the winnowing process is. Um, we select an area from which areas get further identified for leasing. So we would, you know, it sounds like we would be recommending an area that we may not know more about because it's not been part of the planning effort. What I mean, because we're limiting the leasing, um, the planning effort within 1300. And so for us to say, well, you should put it you know, at 1400 or 1500, that wouldn't have been where we would have conducted the planning and leasing um, stakeholder engagement and data gathering. But um, but do you have studies for the wind speeds and stuff out that far? I see you've got wind maps, but I didn't really see how far offshore they went or what depths. Um, most of the, the NREL scope has always been at the 1300 meter um, has been the planning area that we've, you know, we've maintained that in, in all of the, um, the planning uh, documents that uh, we are doing right now. So there's no data that you have yet? 
produced. I this is Frank. I can, I can talk to that just a bit. You, the the Unreal folks, they've done a, you know, created the the wind data we use, and it, it's created from a, a large variety of sources. You know, from a, a satellite data and sonar data, well, that's uh, radar data, and just a, a big variety of wind data over a 20 year history. And it goes, the, I believe, you know, don't quote me precisely on this, but I believe the, the data set they're giving us right now goes out 50 miles, if I'm not mistaken. So it goes out about that, about that far. And based on that number of years of, of data. Thank you, Frank. Um, Bob Dooley. Yeah, thanks, Carrie, and uh, thanks to the council staff and everyone involved here for putting on this uh, great uh, presentation over the last couple of days. I hope uh, it's informed both sides, both Bone and, and us of, of a lot, and I look forward to more of these. Um, I had a question, and it's probably maybe my lack of knowledge. I'll confess that right now, <clears throat> but I'm curious. You have call areas that, for example, might be a thousand square miles. And then someone applies for a lease, a company applies for a lease and chooses a hundred of those thousand square miles where he would like to, or they would like to put uh, their operation. And I assume then there's a vetting process. What is it, if it, if you find out that area is not acceptable, is it bring me another rock or is it, that's not a good place, but this might be better based on all the data that is presented with conflicts of fishing and vessel traffic and every other user group is what's, how is that process done? I'm just trying to get a handle on that. Thank you. Um, um, throughout, I think the first environmental analysis that we do is for lease issuance. So anything that would be leased would have gone through that process. So um, le the lease areas that will be identified will be after we've done a wind energy area um, and after the NEPA for lease issuance has been done. So um, basically we're you know saying this is all where you can nominate areas. I'll follow up if I could. But it, it appears through the conversation in the last couple of days here that there's not a lot of fishing data that's been inter interjected into this to eliminate uh, fishing areas in conflicts with wind energy. So I'm trying to get a handle on when that's identified. And if, if it's identified prior to someone applying for a lease area, so they know that they'll have, that's not a highly desirable place to put it, or is it informed during the process of granting the lease that's that's requested and how does all that work? I'm not quite understanding how how the, the data for fishing is going to get interjected into this system to try to find the areas within the call area that are that have the least amount of conflict with fishing. Um, Rick, do you want to we, I think, I think you went, Rick went over the analysis that goes through at the both phases. Mm -hmm. So do you mind restating that? Sure. I, um, the, I kind of talked about this earlier, so I, I don't want to be too repetitive, but, um, you know, I would say that we, we engage in a very long process that's really a continuum and it, we call it phased, which is a bit of a misnomer, I think, because, we uh, don't stop from the time that we are, are called to begin looking at an area. And as I mentioned before, you know, there was consideration of other uses of the OCS that went into um, the development of the call area. At the call stage, um, at the lease NEPA stage, you know, when we're considering uh, whether to offer an area for lease, um, these are all just opportunities for further refinement and further study and further data gathering where areas may be um, uh, removed from consideration for lease, potential lease or 
you know, the, the call area may be adjusted. Uh, but we get through leasing, we continue to look and we really will get even heavier into uh, data at that point to when we start getting more detail about an actual project. And by the time we're getting closer to that, we're starting to think uh, more about, um, again, it's possible to think about whether there, there's a reason to not build anything there at all. It's also at that point where we might think about, um, uh, you know, not using a part of the lease area or, you know, micrositing layouts and all that kind of stuff to avoid and minimize impacts. So uh, another long winded answer for me, but I, I guess it's a long process. The data feeds into every stage of the process. It gets more refined through time. Um, wondering, I, I, you know, I would, I would, I would not agree with the fact that there was no knowledge of fishing information when we went to the call stage. I mean, I think when we worked with the state at that call stage, we had some understanding as we've heard today that further offshore is better. And that's why these are not at the three mile line, right? That's one of the reasons why these are not at the three mile line. Um, but we continue to gather more information. We'll continue to make refinements as, uh, or I should say our decision makers will continue to consider all that information we give them to, to think about uh, what kind of refinements are called for. So. Well, thanks on that. I, one final question is, is that a, it, will that be a transparent public process when a person or a company applies for a specific lease within a specific call area that that will be public knowledge and announced so that uh, affected parties can weigh in? Yes. Yeah. And their COPs will be published. Um, we have we have kind of parallel public processes, if that's the right way to consider it, because we do have our OXLA and our regulatory leasing process that Nessie is managing. The, and uh, that's sort of where we are right now. You know, we're talking to you all right now as part of that uh, call, you know, as a public process. But when we get into NEPA, uh, which is what my, um, Part of the business will will lead. Um, we'll have our own public processes associated with that. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Bob. Um, Gary Burke. Uh, yeah, it's, I uh, since we're winding down here, I want to thank Bohm and, and uh, the council for putting this on. That to me, I've been to a few of the meetings. This one looks like one of the first. It's really trying to reach out to the stakeholders, actually. And uh, hopefully you're, you're hearing a little bit. You got to remember too, the people on here, a lot of us are just representatives of the fleet. And I hope you really follow out with each of the fleets that are going to be impacted. You're going to get uh, a lot more information that you'll find than uh, I'm filling your data gaps than you'll see on the logs and, and uh, VMS. They're not really complete by any means. So. Uh, I hope that you continue with that because that's where you'll get the most information. And thanks again for putting it on. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. It seems like we're winding down. Um, we can sit here for a couple more minutes and see if there's uh, some hands that go up um, to have some questions that we haven't covered yet. Um, maybe I'll take this time to remind people about a couple of uh, um, items to have on your radar screen um, from our side. And then maybe I, I'll ask uh, Bohm to um, tell us their, uh, you know, maybe six month horizon calendar for key meetings and opportunities. Um, so we have a September Pacific Council meeting. Uh, at this point, marine planning and or offshore wind is not on that agenda. Uh, the council uh, there's always more to put on the agenda than time allows. Uh, and so at the end of the June meeting, which is what we do, as everyone knows, at the end of every meeting, we plan the next meeting and the, and the year out, year plus out. So um, the, this is uh, tentatively on the November council meeting um, as a formal agenda item. And we, of course, will uh, invite um, Bone to be there like they've been before. And I have no idea what that agenda item might look like. We just, we plopped it into our year at a glance. And then um, trying to see your hand up. And then just uh, one more thing, as I had mentioned a couple of times, we have this new marine planning committee that uh, is being convened. And I think 
most of you are on this. I know a couple of uh, mem or nominated members are not on this meeting for personal reasons, that's fine. Um, but we're going to uh, schedule the first meeting for the MPC in sometime in late August or early September. It will be a, um, an open public meeting. It'll be in the Federal Register. It'll um, be announced on our website and it will be emailed out to everyone who is on our email distribution list. And if you wanna get on our email distribution list, um, you don't get spammed with a whole lot of emails. I don't know, a couple few a month maybe. Um, um, but uh, yeah, probably a few a month. Um, just go to our homepage and then you scroll down and I think on the sort of lower right of that main homepage is, uh, is a button you can click to add your email address to um, get uh, information on uh, upcoming council activities. So I just wanted to put that on people's radar screen. Uh, oh, and then of course, uh, related to the NPC meeting that uh, hasn't been scheduled yet, but will be, um, you know, I will take the uh, the notes that um, Kearns and West is putting together for Bohm, um, or I'll let them scrub them first and then take them, and then you know I'll I'm I'm happy to review those at you know sort of at the same time you guys do whatever just let me know um, and then use those to um, you know sort of put a uh, MPC flavor uh, on the meeting and so and uh, so that the committee can. Um, you know, really dive in and uh, think about this and consider how their advice to the council would be best be, um, you know, formulated. Um, and, you know, if there are any recommendations that come out of that first meeting, that's fine too. So they might want to write a letter um, or uh, not. I don't know, we'll see. Um, but anyway, there's a couple of things for your radar screens. Let's go to Karen and then to Peter. Yeah, I, I wanted to add my thanks uh, to Gary's thanks to Bohm uh, for giving us such great um, presentations over the last two days and committing so much time and energy to bringing information and to listening to the different perspectives that you've heard today. And um, as one of the one of the council family who's been connecting with Bohm on a regular basis over the last year um, in, in service to this agreement to coordinate between the Bohm processes and, and PFMC. I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased and grateful for all of this time and that we've added this West Coast synoptic view of federal fisheries and federal fisheries representatives to the state processes that have been going on already in California and Oregon. And, and just as a note, um, and, and Bohm knows this well, but just as a note for, for the community online today is that you know, there is a significant difference between <laughs> state fisheries and federal fisheries and the state fisheries are not represented in the discussion we've had over the last two days, even though it's been brought up in many cases. Um, and so those are different conversations, uh, but what we were doing prior to this webinar today uh, was having input from the state specific perspectives. And so now we have the state's perspectives and the coast-wide perspectives. And they're both important because we have such a broad and diverse uh, set of users. So I, I just wanted to really make that, stress that point um, for everybody involved that I think there's a lot of recognition that that is the case and um, we're all aware of it. Uh, and both processes are, are needed to get a good, um, a good outlook on, on how these wind farms may interact with our fisheries. Um, I also appreciate Bohm's uh, willingness to sit down with some of the key uh, fishery organizations as a result of this meeting uh, today and yesterday and, and um, having those organizations pointed out that they can get even deeper into the weeds on some uh, information needs that Bohm has. Um, so just a whole bunch of thanks and hopefully that, that helps um, maybe bring some, some closure just from, from council member perspective. Uh, and I look forward to the MPC convening for the first time. And we did empower them with 
with uh, the ability to make recommendations to the council uh, to submit comments to BOEM at any time, not just during a regularly scheduled council meeting. So that, that could be initiated by the MPC between now and November. Um, but as Carrie pointed out, that's up to the MPC to really determine uh, and, and elevate to the council. So thank you. Um, and I think that's it from me uh, for the two days. Appreciate it. Thank you, Carr, and thanks for all your help in pulling this together. I appreciate it. Everyone appreciates it. Um, Peter Flournoy. Um, I guess I'm unmuted, so that's great. Uh, first, my, <laughs> first, my apologies. Uh, I came on this call late because I had another meeting involving fisheries management that just got over at about 115, 120. So I apologize if what I'm going to say has already been said. Um, first, I, I join in the thanks to Boehm for being as, uh, I guess I'd call it upfront uh, with what they know and, and what they don't know. And being so willing to listen to a lot of the representatives of the commercial fishermen and sport fishermen um, I, I really appreciate that. I think it is uh, slightly different from what has occurred many times on the East Coast. And, and uh, so I think uh, thanks is, is really due to the Pacific Bowen people. Um, and I, and I also thank them Bob, for agreeing to uh, meet with a number of the fisheries organizations up and down the coast of California. I guess they've already been doing that with organizations in Oregon. Um, but, but I do think uh, we need to follow up on those promises, uh, because that's where BOEM is going to get the best information. Uh, it kind of surprises me. I think we have people from California Fish and Wildlife uh, and some of the other uh, state fisheries um, organizations. It seems to me it wouldn't be that tough for the Department of Fish and Wildlife to send out a one pager to all their license holders uh, suggesting uh, that they get active in this process. Uh, and, and I think, I, I really think that should be done. I also uh, think that people shouldn't rest uh, on their hindquarters because they think all this stuff is, isn't gonna happen for a year or two years or three years. Um, I think we in California have made a huge mistake not being active since 2017 when the task force was first set up. I think we have a lot of catch up to do, particularly in being able to collect and get to BOEM the kind of solid fisheries information that BOEM needs uh, to take into consideration. Um, and I know we're not gonna change it at this point, but I've made this point before that I think BOEM's process uh, is a little backwards. Um, I, I think be, when you start thinking about leasing, you should do more than just uh, geophysical surveys of the ocean floor, that that's when you really need to start looking at what the impacts uh, are going to be of these facilities. But that's not going to change. Um, but what can change is the amount of information that we get to BOEM uh, so they can at least consider it. Um, some of us belong to an organization uh, that has been set up to uh, have responsible offshore 
wind development. And that means uh, commercial fishermen are not against offshore wind development. They just want to see it done in a manner that's compatible with their centuries old occupation. Uh, once again, and thank you, Carrie, for uh, the way you've run these meetings and, uh, and all your staff who have been involved in, uh, in putting these two days together. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> Looking for any more hands. Okay, well, I guess then we're uh, kind of at the precipice of adjournment. Um, Nessie, uh, do you have any closing words for the group? Um, sure. You know, I, I just want to want to thank um, everyone for sticking with us for these two days. Um, we yeah. asked for a lot of time, um, and and we're very glad that you gave it to us. Um, special thanks to Kerry for his facilitation and just hosting and. Um, taking care of logistics, um, I think it, it, it's really very helpful and um, made life a little bit easier for us on, on that end. And, and, and Karen for um, just helping to, you know, um, you know, helping us plan um, this concept that we all had talked about before. And, and I think that today we learned a lot from, from everyone that's there um, that, that attended today. And, um, you know, we covered a lot of ground, but there's more work that needs to be done. And I'm just hoping that, you know, everyone can, you know, like, we're pretty informal in the region. So, you know, if you have um, comments or you want to get in touch with us, you know, feel free to reach out to any one of us that you met here at the webinar. Uh, we'll be happy to, to respond and answer questions to the extent that we can. And if we don't know, then we'll, you know, we'll consult with others. Um, just in terms of what could be expected from the bomb site, uh, as I mentioned, what, what is that, several hours ago in the beginning, look out for um, the publication of the call uh, for the additional areas in the Morro Bay, and then also the um, announcements of the area ID for the North Coast. As soon as those are available, um, uh, we can you know send it to, if you're not already on the BOEM updates, um, please, you know, put your email, uh, go through our websites and, and add that. But at a minimum, I'll, I'll uh, make sure that um, Carrie has uh, the links and the information on, on those two announcements. Um, in Oregon, we're going to be holding um, two data review sessions in, in August. Uh, one is on August 4th and the other is on August 11th. The one on August 11th is going to focus more on phishing data sets. And so we'll, we'll have, um, I think, Andy Lanier from the Department of Land Conservation Department in, in Oregon. Uh, he'll go through the data sets that we have in Orwin. And so um, and I think Frank will probably give, um, you might see some of the same, you know, similar slides that he presented here in that webinar. So that is on August 11th. Um, we ask that you pre-register just so um, we have links right and know who's who's coming. If if you can do that, you can register also at the at the Oregon website for that. Um, and then I invite other BOEM colleagues if they have would like to say something else. I'll second all that all of that, Nessie. Thank you um, for your wrap up there. I will also encourage people to reach out to us to continue to reach out to us. Some of you are taking us up on that uh, already. So I appreciate that. I am really in awe of your commitment uh, to these meetings. I know a lot of you were with us all day last Thursday too. Um, and these last couple of days, your endurance is impressive. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, really great to see you all uh, um, so committed to this process. It's gonna be better because of your input. Uh, we're gonna have better outcomes because of you. So thank you so much. Um, so, any anyone else from Bone? Oh, Nessie, real quick. Uh, I thought you said uh, August 4th was the um, ODF and W fishing data set. Yeah, there's two of them. There, the August 4th is like biological, you know, non fishery. And then August 11th is the fisheries. Ah, okay. So they're both fishery data sets. 
Well, um, no, the other one. Well, you know, you're welcome to do well, by a lot, right? Yeah. So August fourth is more sort of habitat, uh, non-fishery biology. Yeah, like maybe birds there too. Um, yeah, and then August eleventh is really more focus on the fishing data sets. On the fishery. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Appreciate it. Um, all right. Well, I'll finish with my thanks to everyone, uh, all the BOEM staff, and everyone who attended. This was a, a bit of a marathon, and uh, I know that the council staff or the council uh, AB members and council members are um, not unused to uh, these types of meetings, um, and um, we just haven't always done them um, virtually until about a year and a half. Um, and I also appreciate uh, everyone's um, <clears throat> participation and respectful uh, and professional comments. One of our uh, ground rules that we pretty regularly have to share with, uh, you know, at the outset of our meetings is um, please play nice, be professional, um, and, um, um, uh, you know, be respectful in your discussions. And obviously, uh, I didn't even have to say that here. So uh, it was very, uh, it was a very uh, professional conversation. So uh, thank everyone for that. Um, and we will be having more of these. So thanks again. You have a good weekend. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Carrie.